Members of a government operations subcommittee gathered this past Tuesday to consider legislation concerning the release of documents which relate to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The measure would create a judicially appointed review board to oversee the release of thousands of classified documents dating back nearly three decades. On Monday evening, the subcommittee received a letter from the Justice Department strongly opposing the legislation. The letter raised several objections from questions of constitutionality to a need to protect intelligent sources and methods. The subcommittee chairman, Democrat John Conyers of Michigan, said he was surprised by the letter because the FBI and the CIA had already expressed their support for the release of the assassination documents. Several witnesses testified at Tuesday's hearing, including film director Oliver Stone, whose recent movie, JFK, has rekindled public interest in the Kennedy assassination. We will also hear from Congressman Lewis Stokes, who had served as chairman of the old House Select Committee on Assassinations. He is the sponsor of House Joint Resolution 454 regarding the release of the Kennedy files now. And so we take you to the Rayburn House office building here on Capitol Hill for Tuesday's hearing, which was gaveled to order by Congressman Conyers. Hey, we're, don't I have a bigger gap? Subcommittee will come to order. The assassination of President John F. Kennedy is a tragedy which touched all of us who were here in 1963 and which continues to be felt to this day. We lost a unique leader who brought a singular humanity and a lasting vision to American policy both at home and abroad. Indeed, the loss of John Kennedy's leadership haunts America today as his vision of common sacrifice for the common good is now often displaced by cynical politics of self-interest and greed. Today we consider legislation that would publicly release the investigative files and other documents relating to the assassination. Isn't it time for the American people to at least know what its government knows and what information has been kept from them about what happened at 12.30 p.m. in Dallas, Texas on November 22, 1963. Too many feel that something is being concealed, and the only way to put these concerns to rest is to open the files now. The circumstances of the murder of President Kennedy and the death of the accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald shortly after his apprehension profoundly shocked the American people. The 1964 Warren Commission conclusion that Oswald acting alone was responsible for the death of President Kennedy has been questioned from the day it was first made public. The, anas the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator Robert F. Kennedy in 1968 increased doubts in the minds of millions of Americans. Subsequently, Revelations of bizarre plots by the Central Intelligence Agency to eliminate Fidel Castro made the rumors of a conspiracy, and I use the word advisedly, not entirely out of the realm of possibility. After the 1972 Watergate break-in, some accused CIA operatives of having a hand in the death of President Kennedy. This allegation was probed and rejected in 1975 by the Rockefeller Commission, which was appointed by President Ford to investigate CIA activities in the United States. Shortly thereafter, in 1976, the Senate Intelligence Committee, <laughs> chaired by Frank Church, disclosed that the CIA had engaged in efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro and other leaders in other governments in the early 1960s. It also reported that information relating to these plots had been concealed from the Warren Commission. Later in 1976, the House of Representatives established a select committee on assassination to reopen the investigation of the assassination of President Kennedy. 
Chaired by Lewis Stokes of Ohio, that committee concluded in its 1979 report that there was substantial evidence that Oswald had not acted alone. Now, 28 years after President Kennedy's death, there exists hundreds of thousands of pages of documents relating to the assassination that are still secret from the American people in Congress. Some of these files belong to the Warren Commission, the Rockefeller Commission, the Central Intelligence Agency. Others were created by Congressional Investigation, the Senate's Church Committee, and the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Five percent of the CIA files have been released under the Freedom of Information Act, but not so with the files from the Rockefeller Commission, the Church Committee, or the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Under current law, many of these materials will still be hidden from public view until the year 2029. If there is no legitimate national security reason to keep them secret any longer, hasn't the time come to end this unnecessary and destructive secrecy? House Joint Resolution 454 would end a pattern of secrecy which to this day fuels the public doubts about the assassination of President Kennedy. I believe the Congress is ready to act and bring an end to this damaging secrecy. In preparation for this hearing, I invited both the Attorney General and the Director of the CIA to testify. They were not able to be here today. And after much negotiation, I can report that the subcommittee will hear the views of CIA Director Robert Gates in mid-May, but we're still negotiating with the Department of Justice to come forward and tell the truth. Late last night, we received the Department of Justice's position, and my worst fears were realized. Uh, they raised every conceivable legal objection uh, in an eight-page single-space letter. There's not one suggestion of how we might actually work together, the administration and the, uh, and the Congress, uh, to release these documents to the American people. And I, for one, don't understand this resistance. I had expected cooperation and not stonewalling. I think there's a simple principle that should guide us in uh, considering the legislation before this committee. If there's nothing to hide, open up the files. In the event of uh, this, in an events of this magnitude, continued secrecy is the most damaging course that we can take in a democratic society. This resolution before us establishes a reasonable way to release these documents. It accommodates legitimate security needs and ensures an independent review of such claims while mandating the prompt release of all records. It's a resolution which strikes the proper balance, and I congratulate its author, Chairman Lewis Stokes of Ohio, and commend it to the members of this subcommittee for their favorable consideration. And I'm now pleased to recognize the ranking member of the government operations, the distinguished gentleman from New York, Mr. Frank Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, at the outset, I'd like to commend you for holding this hearing and um, taking the lead in uh, this effort to uh, release uh, these materials. Um, today, we are beginning a process that, although it probably should have been started years ago, does fall within the normal declassification time frame. That is the opening of all the records and materials surrounding the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. It's been almost 30 years since that dreadful day in Dallas, and 30 years has now become the somewhat accepted standard for review and declassification of records. In short, while perhaps long overdue because of the controversy surrounding the tragedy, this upcoming 30th uh, year anniversary does fall within the normal time limits and it should not be missed. To further delay releasing the material would simply add to the already simmering controversy. Therefore, I fully support opening all the appropriate records, and as you know, Mr. Chairman, along with you, I am a co-sponsor of the legislation which was introduced by the distinguished former Chairman of the House Select Committee on Assassination, Chairman 
uh, and uh, Congressman Lou Louis Stokes, who will be uh, one of our witnesses, and I want to welcome him and Lee Hamilton uh, to the witness table here this morning. I also um, would like to make reference to the fact that um, it's my understanding that former President uh, Gerald Ford, who uh, was a member of the House of Representatives and um, was the um, Republican leader at the time of the assassination and a good friend of mine and who served on the Warren Commission has written a letter to the uh, speaker and to uh, Mr. Stokes. Uh, I don't have a copy of the letter, but I'm going to ask Mr. Stokes later if he would make it available to us. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask unanimous consent that we put that letter in the record. It's my understanding that that letter addressed to Mr. Stokes and, and Speaker Foley uh, did indicate uh, former President uh, Gerald Ford and a member of the Warren Commission's position that um, all the records should be disclosed and should be done um, uh, forthwith. The only restriction that um, former President Ford uh, stated uh, from what I understand in the letter was that um, uh, he would retain all those restrictions laid down by the Kennedy family, limiting access to the uh, autopsy photographs and x-ray material to qualified medical experts. These limitations, as Mr. Ford indicated, could be waived, of course, or removed by the, the Kennedy family at, at, their, at their request. Mr. Chairman, although I'm in favor of, of um, making this uh, uh, information available as quickly as possible, this doesn't mean that I have no reservations about the process that we're about to begin. I support finding the truth, not prolonging the tragedy, and I fear that that might be the result. I'm afraid we might be falling into the all-too-frequent situation of simply following the latest fad. A few months ago, just one author suggested that President Zachary Taylor had been poisoned, so we dug up that poor old gentleman, all to no avail. Another author had a theory that President Lincoln had Marfan syndrome, so there are now some suggestions for DNA examinations. And of course, the major impetus to the current move to re-examine the Kennedy assassination is the movie JFK with its broad conspiratorial thesis that can probably never be proved. Mr. Chairman, I support the uh, opening and the review of the old records as we approach the normal 30-year review anniversary date. And I sincerely hope that the full satisfactory truth will be discovered and that this matter can finally be put to rest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Horton. The chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Christopher Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to join with my ranking member in expressing appreciation that you're conducting these hearings and also to welcome all our witnesses, our, our fine uh, colleagues from the House and uh, those who will uh, follow. follow. And I just want to say, Mr. Chairman, that I as well am a co-sponsor of this legislation. I believe that disclosure is needed, necessary, and should happen very quickly. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Stephen Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, want to thank you for holding this hearing and commend you for selecting this subject matter. I want to make a very brief observation. I remember, as a high school student, the tragic assassination of President Kennedy and the subsequent Warren Commission, and I remember having a personal impression uh, in listening to the debate after the Warren Commission's report that, that frankly, uh, the Warren Commission leaned towards sustaining one particular view of the assassination. And uh, this is not to say that any other theory is correct, that, the, that there's some great conspiracy, but I had the impression that we weren't told everything at the time. And my own view is that while we should listen to the Justice Department's uh, uh, objections to releasing information 30 years after the fact, uh, the Justice Department has a very heavy burden, in my opinion, in suggesting that everything shouldn't be released at this time. And I support the legislation that's being considered. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, to Mr. Schiff. Uh, the chair is pleased to welcome our Government Operations Committee member from California, Matthew Martinez, who, who's always on the case. Good morning and welcome. You want to say anything? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I'm very interested in the hearing and uh, in hearing the uh, witnesses. And again, you're to be commended. Uh, the I know that, uh, like Mr. Schiff, when this happened, uh, I was a uh, young businessman uh, just starting my own business, and uh, I remember we had a good number of employees uh, who uh, were actually devastated by the events that took place. 
And almost from the beginning, there was questions in their minds um, as to the, what actually happened. And as the Warren Commission and all of the other uh, investigative agencies proceeded, and the answers that came out in the newspaper, there was even more questions uh, that were brought up. And I guess from the beginning, any time you have a, a great event like this and a controversy that follows that there will always be controversy. Uh, I think that uh, if the public has a right to know, they have a right to know everything. And for that reason, I'm, uh, I have co-authored uh, Mr. Stokes' uh, legislation in making the evidence available to the public and uh, the files, the investigative files and the information contained therein. Uh, I uh, don't know that it will really resolve anything, uh, but I do believe that the public has a right to know. So I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings. Thank you very much, Mr. Martinez. Our first panel starts off with the author of the measure before us. Uh, Congressman Lou Stokes was chairman of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. He's also served as chair of the Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, he is extremely well qualified to discuss releasing government uh, records relating to the Kennedy assassination. He's accompanied by Professor Robert Blakey of the Notre Dame Law School, who was the former general counsel to the House Assassinations Committee. We're going to then uh, hear from our friend uh, Congressman Lee Hamilton, also a former chairman of Intelligence Committee. Uh, Congressman Chairman Stokes of Ohio, we welcome you before the committee to be our first witness. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Horton, and members of the committee. Uh, firstly, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to thank you. Uh, when I introduced this resolution, it was referred to four committees here in the Congress. Uh, because of your leadership, this is the first committee to begin hearings on this resolution, and I applaud you for taking the leadership role along with Mr. Horton and the members of this committee. <clears throat> I thank you for this opportunity to testify in support of House Joint Resolution 454, the Assassinations Materials Disclosure Act of 1992. As the former chairman of the House Select Committee on Assassinations, I am proud to sponsor this legislation, providing for the expeditious release of materials in the possession of the government relevant to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This resolution was introduced because of the renewed public interest and concern over the records pertaining to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. In order to provide a better understanding of the drafting of H.J. Res. 454, and I have to, to uh, commend, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the work of Professor Blakey, who, uh, as former chairman of this committee and now professor of law at uh, Notre Dame Law School, has devoted a considerable amount of, of his time uh, on a pro bono basis to the drafting of this resolution. <clears throat> it is important that you have some understanding of the nature of the committee's work and the process of our investigation. As you know, the House Select Committee on Assassinations was constituted on September 17, 1976 during the second session of the 94th Congress. Its original chairman was Thomas N. Downing, who retired at the end of that Congress. The committee was recreated on February 2, 1977, during the 95th Congress, with Congressman Henry Gonzalez appointed as its new chairman. Shortly thereafter, he resigned the chairmanship, and on March 8, 1977, I was appointed to chair the Select Committee on Assassinations. Under the House resolution that created the Select Committee on Assassinations, we were authorized and directed to conduct a full and complete investigation surrounding the assassination and the death of President John F. Kennedy. This included first the facts and circumstances surrounding the death of President Kennedy and the connection of any between President Kennedy, those facts and circumstances, and the accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Second, the question of whether there was a conspiracy in the case. And third, the performance of the various federal agencies, including the FBI, the CIA, the Secret Service, the Warren Commission, and others. The committee, in the course of its investigation, had at one time or the other in its possession approximately 370 cubic feet of files. Among the materials contained in these files were classified and unclassified materials on loan from federal agencies, materials generated by committee staff, materials on loan from private individuals, transcripts of committee open session hearings, 
and meetings and from executive sessions, hearings and meetings. These materials are well organized with an extensive card index to individual documents. I would ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, the protocol issued by our committee be made a part of the official record here also. Without objection, so ordered, Mr. Stokes. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, the committee also conducted approximately 18 days of public hearings from August through December of 1978, as well as two days of public policy hearings. During the public hearings, the committee received evidence on the issues we had identified to fulfill the legislative mandate. Our committee completed this investigation and on March 29, 1979, filed a final report with the House of Representatives. In addition to the final report, 12 volumes of evidentiary material relating to this investigation were filed with the House of Representatives, printed by the government printing office, and then made available to the American public. Prior to the committee running out of both time and money, we released everything we had the time and resources to release. All of our other records were placed in the National Archives under House of Representatives Rule, Rule 36, requiring such unpublished records routinely to be sealed for 30 to 50 years. There has been considerable debate about these records, including accusations that these records, if released, would contain evidence of a government cover-up or complicity of government agencies in the assassination of President Kennedy. I can assure my colleagues that nothing could be further from the truth. No member of the committee, nor member of the staff, participated in any cover-up of the truth. It is important that the good work of our committee not be impugned by such baseless accusations. Our committee attempted to conduct its investigation into the assassination of the President and to present the results of that investigation to the Congress and to the American people in a thorough and dignified manner in keeping with the memory of this great leader. Mr. Chairman, I am committed to the principle that Americans are entitled to know the truth about the assassination of President Kennedy and feel that Congress should do its best to allay fears of the American people in this regard. The American public deserve to know the factual truth about this important event in our nation's history. I'm pleased to be before you this morning I would be pleased to try and answer any questions that you or members of the committee might have. Well, I think the best evidence of your sincerity is that you wrote the bill for the Congress to declassify the information that's stacked up by the boxes, maybe by the tons, and release it to the public unless there's some good reason notwithstanding. And we haven't heard any yet. I turn now to the another former chairman of the Intelligence Committee, the gentleman from Indiana, Congressman Lee Hamilton, who has been an invaluable advocate in support of the further release of government records and for a re-examination re of the classification system used throughout government. He also serves with great distinction uh, on the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee. We welcome you, uh, Chairman Hamilton, to this proceeding. Thank you very much, <coughs> Chairman Conyers, uh, Mr. Horton, Mr. Schiff, Mr. Shays, Mr. Martinez. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to testify before your committee on this important bill. I'm pleased to join with you, Mr. Chairman, and Mr. Horton and Chairman Stokes as an original co-sponsor of the bill. <coughs> I hope that both houses of Congress will act swiftly with due care to protect national security interests to pass this bill, send it to the President, and I hope that he will promptly sign it. The time has come to open the files and make public all the information we can about this tragic event in our nation's history. The bill before us today does several things. It would make public not only material from the House Select Committee, I understand the Select Committee has over 800 boxes now on, uh, available, but also material from other agencies of government, including the Warren Commission, the CIA. I'm told the CIA has 300,000 pages. FBI, Justice Department, and other executive branch departments and agencies, as well as material from the Senate Church Committee investigation. The bill mandates a comprehensive review of all federal government records relating to the assassination of President Kennedy. It establishes an independent, impartial, five-member review board to conduct this review. This bill appropriately provides an exemption for material which would infringe on an individual's privacy rights 
or would compromise current intelligence sources or methods. Due care is taken to adhere to our intelligence standards and to protect them. But the premise of the bill is in favor of the public's right to know, as it should be. A number of recent polls have shown that approximately 75 percent of the American people believe that there was a conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. Of this number, about half believe that the CIA was involved in such a conspiracy. These are astonishing figures. We cannot remove all doubts about the institutions of our government with this or any other single bill, but we can take a step in the direction of openness. I'm not here to suggest that there was any conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy. I simply do not know. My interest in the bill is to get as much information out into the public domain as we can and let the debate go forward on the basis of as much factual information as possible so that the debate about these events will not be encumbered with charges of cover-up. Sufficient time has now passed since 1963 that concerns which may have caused information to be withheld at that time should generally no longer be a consideration. The worst thing we can do is to feed the cynicism that already exists by creating a perception that something is being concealed from the American people. We are today, unfortunately, in a climate of cynicism about government, and if information is withheld, it only adds to that cynicism and lack of trust in government. This is one of many efforts that must be undertaken to restore public confidence in the Congress and in our government. The Kennedy assassination will be debated probably for centuries to come. It is the subject of a remarkable film, JFK, produced by Oliver Stone, and that film discusses much, deserves much of the credit for the interest in this subject. As with the assassination of President Lincoln, we may never know the full truth of these events. But the assassination of President Kennedy was an event of enormous importance in American history and has been the focus of tremendous controversy. We need to make as much information public as we can and then let the journalists, the scholars, and the historians, and the ordinary Americans try to resolve the questions that remain based on all the available information. May I take this opportunity to commend our colleague Lou Stokes, who is here today, both for taking the lead in introducing this bill and for his leadership in chairing the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Like many other assignments which he has taken on during his distinguished career, this was difficult, controversial, and thankless, and he did it with extraordinary skill. I commend you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Horton, for holding this hearing and for moving promptly on the bill. The committee is playing a vital role in the process of reviewing questions of government secrecy and accountability. This bill is a small step toward making government more open and accountable, but it will help the process of restoring the trust and confidence of the American people in the institutions of their government. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Hamilton, Chairman Stokes. We're very grateful for your many, many years of service on this subject. It's been a difficult, arduous task, and I think the American people are grateful to both of you for your work. Uh, Lou Stokes, I want to ask you one question. You've developed on this bill a set of standards in the resolution for when it's appropriate to postpone the release of assassination records. Question, will these standards protect the privacy rights of individuals as well as national security secrets? Could you explain why these tighter standards are needed to get these records released? <coughs> Uh, the thrust, uh, Mr. Chairman, of the legislation, frankly, is to release everything that is releasable. That is the thrust of the legislation. We had to take into account that uh, there are some areas in which we have to initiate some uh, protective uh, uh, restriction and language. And, of course, in that case, uh, matters of privacy, for instance, so that we do not uh, in any manner um, defame uh, private persons who are, who are still alive and things of that sort. So we have certain language in there for that. In terms of national security, we still want to release everything that's releasable without in any way harming our national security. So there is some tight language in there with reference to that. But wherever we postpone the release of anything. There are measures also there for further review by the Congress 
so that ultimately everything will be released. So these standards will expedite the release of the material while protecting privacy and legitimate national security concerns. That is correct. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. You, Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to commend both um, um, Congressman Stokes um, and also uh, Lee Hamilton for the uh, many hours that they've uh, devoted to their work here in the House of Representatives. Uh, I know the Congress is under attack uh, by people all over the country, but uh, this is a good example. These two men are good examples of the type of dedication and hard work that we have in the Congress. Mr. Stokes not only served as chairman of this uh, very select uh, committee, which had a very responsible uh, role to play and which played that uh, that role very responsibly and uh, made its report. Um, Mr. Hamilton the same, uh, member of the Intelligence Committee and uh, much of the work that he does goes unnoticed. I know Mr. Stokes has served also as the chairman and is continuing to serve as the chairman of the Ethics Committee and uh, that's a very uh, difficult job. Many, many hours are taken and both these men represent uh, I think the best of the of the House of Representatives and the work that they've done. And I want to commend both of them for the work that they've done, particularly in this, uh, in this area of investigating the uh, assassination of President Kennedy. I was in the Congress at that time. Um, matter of fact, I was up in my district uh, on that afternoon uh, when I got word and came right back um, uh, to Washington and uh, attended the, um, the funeral services. And I know uh, in that day uh, it was a very controversial subject. And uh, we did have the Warren Commission um, established. Um, the only surviving member of that Warren Commission is a, Congress, a former congressman and former president, Gerald Ford. And I just wanted to ask Mr. Stokes to uh, provide us with the letter that I referred to earlier and I would like to include it in the record at this point, Mr. Chairman, because I think it does indicate that Mr. Ford, a member of that commission, was uh, and is anxious that these, um, that these records be released. And um, as far as I know, there's only one uh, uh, suggestion that he makes uh, with regard to uh, preservation of of uh, material. Without objection, the letter will be included in the record. Which has to do with the Kennedy family. Um, the, other, the other point I would make uh, in that connection is it's kind of coincidental, but there is in my district established at the Rochester Institute of Technology, the Horton Scholars, and um, Mr. Ford is supposed to be speaking there this evening, but unfortunately he had an operation recently on his knee and was not able to keep that commitment. I'm sure he'll do it at a later date. But it is kind of ironic that uh, on this very day that we start this hearing that uh, he, uh, being a member of that Warren Commission, and I remember talking to him about the, uh, the Warren Commission and the work that they did. It was uh, very exhaustive. It took many, many hours, and, and it was a very complete uh, study. And then the next uh, study was conducted by, of course, Mr. Stokes and, and his uh, uh, committee. One of the things I wanted to ask with regard to this legislation, uh, Lou, is um, um, the administration has some constitutional problems with regard to um, uh, the appointment of the board by the court rather than by the president. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? <coughs> okay. Firstly, may I say uh, in response to your question relative to former President Ford, um, Former President Ford was one of our public witnesses uh, during the time that we conducted our public hearings relative to this investigation. He was very cooperative with us, uh, personally appeared as a witness and, and made a great contribution to our investigation. Uh, during the course here where we have now been uh, considering introducing this resolution, uh, during the public controversy surrounding this, surrounding this matter, President Ford did uh, write a letter to me and uh, the thrust of the letter was that all the materials should be released including the Warren Commission materials and our materials and other materials and uh, he was very helpful to us in that respect. I put his, uh, his letter in fact in the congressional record some weeks ago and when we drafted this resolution we had in mind 
uh, the suggestions um, of President Ford because one of the things that he uh, also wanted done was to have the Justice Department do some additional work with reference to the acoustical data, the scientific uh, data that was gathered by our committee. So uh, we're very pleased to say to you that uh, uh, not only did we receive his letter, uh, and we're pleased to provide to you for this record, but uh, President Ford is very helpful to us. Uh, now with reference to uh, this resolution that I introduced, prior to doing so, I was in touch with the, the CIA, the FBI, the Secret Service, the directors and heads of each of those agencies. Each of them pledged to me total cooperation that whenever we, we file this resolution, uh, not only would we have their complete cooperation, they indicated that they had already begun to gather the materials, and in case of the CIA, they had even sent for former employees who would be familiar with those files uh, for the purpose of getting them in order so that whenever the Congress acted, they could expeditiously release those records and files to us. So. Our response, both to me and to Professor Blakey, uh, was very good from the heads of each of those agencies. When we drafted the resolution, we thought it best to have an independent agency that is uh, comprised of five distinguished individuals who had no former relationship with this committee or any committees in the Congress or with any government agencies so that there would be no question in the public's mind about uh, the ability of these five people to, to look at any requests for release of materials and be able to do it in a fair, impartial, and judicious manner. And that's why we felt that in the same manner that special prosecutors are appointed uh, to do special investigations, that the Court of Appeals here in the District of Columbia ought to be the appointing authority. I would still think that we ought to take it out of the realm of politics in terms of a political appoint appointment uh, by the President of the United States so that the American public will have total confidence in this fair and impartial board appointed by a court of law. Uh, one other question I wanted to ask. Um with your background in, in uh, Lee Hamilton's and intelligence matters, do you have any fears that releasing so-called raw material will end up just prolonging the debate? I assume the files are full of uh, unsubstantiated and unverifiable records that could uh, quite easily be misinterpreted. Uh, is there some concern on your part with regard to that? Certainly. I will also yield, of course, to, to Mr. Hamilton for, for his views, and, and I'll have great respect for his views, too. Uh, one of the things Mr. Horton and I am most proud of is that in the 13 years that have transpired since we completed our investigation, not a single person, not a single living person has been defamed in any manner by any of the materials which were in the possession of our committee. Um, we released everything we could release. Those materials which we sealed, uh, were sealed because we didn't have the time to release them and so forth, but we were very careful about not wanting to put into the public domain any type of raw data, unsubstantiated data, rumor, myth, uh, hearsay, that type of thing that could harm living individuals. We still have those same type of concerns and do not feel that it helps the American public to have thrown out into the, to the public domain information that would tend to, to harm or, or defame living individuals. But there is no restriction now on, on that type of material. In other words, the material that you're talking about that was, uh, was uh, sealed would now be released. Is that correct? Well, th there are privacy limitations under this resolution. Well, but with that exception, uh, privacy. But with that exception, all the materials would, would now be released, which would mean some raw material. Well, we do have restrictions dealing with, with national security matters also. Uh, there, there are several restrictions that are built into this resolution, which we would anticipate that the executive committee 
would uh, would adhere to. Lee, uh, Mr. Horton and <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, it's just my impression that uh, Chairman Stokes has done an excellent job in protecting both the national security interests and the privacy interests in the manner in which he has drafted the bill, and I commend him for that. You asked if material could be released that would be misinterpreted. I assure you that material will be released that will be misinterpreted. Uh, but that's part of the discussion and debate that will have to go forward in order to arrive at uh, truth in the end, we, we hope. And let me just add a word that I, I hope very much that this bill can go forward and be enacted by the President, that it will not become a matter of uh, debate about a veto. Uh, I hope that can be avoided. And I want to agree with we you. Want on, to work I want with the administration. To yield. I want to agree with you on yeah. that. I hope that we can get a bill that the president will sign. Absolutely. The the provision. This bill should not become the grounds for a presidential veto. We're basically all in accord, I think, on the premise, and that is to release as much information as possible. In the event of a veto, which none of us want, then I hope that at a minimum the House would uh, pass a resolution to release the files of the House Select Committee and set a good example for the, uh, the executive branch and then have the executive branch follow through and release as much as possible. Great idea. Thank you very much. Mr. Chris Chase is recognized now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, as I listen to the questions uh, and the answers to the questions, I just can't help but wonder um, if we do partial disclosure, uh, if we're still not going to have the same problem just come up. And I guess my, my basic question I could ask you, Mr. Stokes, uh, Congressman Du, did you see much information that you would feel needs to be held, withheld because of national security reasons? Mr. Shays, I, I would say that uh, in terms of national security, uh, what, of course, you attempt to, to protect are sources and methods. I would think that, that 30 years later, our sources and methods uh, uh, back in 1963 uh, would no longer affect our social, our national security today. And I would think that in all probability a great deal of that material will be releasable. Uh, as well as, as much of the classified uh, documentation that we had around that time. But that's why we do need uh, an executive board that will very carefully scrutinize those materials. But the thrust of the legislation is to try, even in that area, the area of national security, to release as much as is releasable. And I think that's consonant with uh, what the CIA is trying to do right now um, under its, its current director, who has ordered a review of all of, of uh, their classified documents to see what documents have heretofore been classified that can be declassified and released in the public domain. So I would think that that can be done under this legislation. As a member of Congress, I, as do all members of Congress, get to see classified information and quite often I wonder why it's classified, but I have to think going back 30 years ago that we're talking about practically a, just a very tiny amount that would have to be classified. But I certainly would hope that this wouldn't be a, a uh, be an abused uh, process. And let me just ask you the, the other question. Yes, yes, definitely, Mr. Hamilton. You've raised an excellent point. You've got to be very careful in this bill that the loopholes don't swallow it, mm -hmm. that the loopholes become so large that an awful lot of information is held back. I think the bill is carefully crafted. It does protect things that ought to be protected, privacy and national security. But all of us know that when you interpret national security, you can get a wide, wide variety of what constitutes national security. That's why the board that the chairman has recommended becomes very, very critical. You've got to get people there with very good judgment who will restrict as much as possible the information on very, a narrow definition of national security and, of course, an appropriate consideration of privacy rights. But we've got to be very careful once this bill is enacted, if it is enacted, that it be implemented in such a way to fully achieve what we're seeking. Uh, let me ask the second question. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Did uh, and either of you could respond? Did have either of you seen uh, documentation that would tell you that there needs to be much uh, information held based on privacy interests? Uh, 
Yes, I, uh, Mr. Shays, I would say that there is quite a bit of information in there that would fall in that category. Uh, and in particular, we might mention to you uh, in the electronic surveillance area, uh, that's a, an area we'd be particularly concerned about in terms of privacy. Well, I just, I would conclude by just sharing my colleague, uh, Mr. Hamilton's comments that uh, I think that, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, but I'm just left with tremendous concern that we not compromise the bill in order to get something that is veto-proof. I would rather see us uh, uh, argue for a bill that we really believe will provide that disclosure and limit the amount of national security documents that will be withheld or privacy uh, documents that will be withheld and that we have the kind of disclosure that will really, I think, uh, result in what we want and that is for the information to be out there and to be debated by all, uh, all Americans. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Without objection, the Chair will include in the record the uh, letter from the Department of Justice expressing their views on the uh, pending matter. I'm pleased now to recognize the gentleman from Oklahoma, Ranking Member of Government Operations, Mr. Glenn English. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I simply want to say that I support this legislation uh, wholeheartedly. Uh, Mr. Stokes, pursuing uh, uh, the, the privacy issue, as I understand it, uh, what this legislation does in effect is, uh, is lifts the, the classified, uh, uh, the classification, uh, but uh, from a privacy standpoint goes beyond uh, uh, what uh, exists under uh, the federal law uh, governing privacy today on other information being held by the federal government. Is that correct? I don't uh, actually, Mr. English, uh, it will uh, release more information under this resolution. Well, I understand it releases more information, but it was my understanding that the privacy provisions contained in the bill exceed what uh, the normal privacy provisions are under the law for other information being held by the federal government, regardless of what that information may be. Is that correct or not? Does this go beyond? It has more out. That's more out. Okay. Yeah, you're correct. This this will okay. this resolution will let more out. Okay, but that is correct. Okay. If protects privacy case by case, but there's some total prohibitions of current law that would be on partial prohibition in this law. Okay. It is my understanding that this resolution uh, will will protect will protect on a case-by-case -case basis. But overall, in the application of it, it will release more information uh, than is currently released under the privacy laws. I understand, but uh, right. of course each, each case, information that uh, with regard to individuals is the way the Privacy uh, Act is, is applied is on a case-by-case -case basis as well. Um, and uh, I guess I, this is something I want to check into a little bit more, but it was my understanding that, the, that there are special provisions in this bill governing privacy as opposed to simply uh, opening it up and uh, uh, to uh, uh, scrutiny under the uh, uh, ordinary Privacy Act. You have the Privacy Act and then there are provisions contained in this bill. So there, there are special provisions built into the bill that will, in effect, provide additional privacy protection over and above what is the ordinary uh, privacy protection on any documents that are held by the federal government. You are correct, Mr. English. Uh, we set aside the Privacy Act, and it is not applicable uh, to under this legislation. Okay, that is correct. But there are special provisions built into it. Yeah, but with we privacy. build in special provisions right. okay. uh, to protect privacy. Thank you very Under much, this Mr. Legislation. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Hamilton. May I ask to be excused? I have a hearing myself that I should be conducting at this point, and I'm uh, quite tardy in, in getting there. I apologize to uh, well, we'll you and to Mr. Stokes. We'll have to take a vote in secrecy <laughs> of the committee to determine whether to let you I, go I, or not. I appreciate the consideration <laughs> of the chair and the members. And Thank uh, you very yeah, much, Chairman you. Hamilton. Yeah, thanks, Thank you. Uh, chair recognized the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I know we have a number of other witnesses, so I'll be brief. I just want to echo the sentiments I've heard from the chair, my ranking member, Mr. Horton, and the witnesses. I think that public confidence in government in this country is at an all-time low. 
And I think that's the case for a number of reasons. But I think one of those reasons is the public belief that government simply won't tell them the truth. And that government hides information uh, nearing, in their minds, a cover-up. I think the whole issue we're talking about here is not whether necessarily there was a massive conspiracy involving the assassination of our late president, but whether the American people are being given all the facts that can be given out so that they can make a judgment for themselves and that the matter can be debated publicly. Uh, Thirty years after these tragic events, I believe that most of the reasons, if they existed, uh, for keeping much of this information confidential simply don't exist anymore. And I think the time is now to act. And I commend Mr. Stokes for sponsoring the bill. And I yield back any time. Thank you very much. Mr. Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as I sit here and listen to, to your testimony and, and read the bill and listen to uh, and the comments of my colleagues uh, on the question of how much information is going to be divulged, uh, I conjure up a vision that unless the board that's selected by the Court of Appeals of Washington, D.C. are people that are absolutely credible and have a good reputation with the American public, uh, it might be tarnished into another situation of uh, another cover-up. Uh, because there is going to be some information withheld. The whole reason of this whole exercise is to make sure that the public knows as much as the government knows about what happened, because that's the question, what happened? There are people, as um, was outlined in, in Mr. Hamilton's uh, testimony, and Congressman Hamilton's testimony, that says that the percentages of the people who believe there were, was a conspiracy, unless there's full disclosure with as much possible pertinent information as can be disclosed, uh, there's still the, the, the controversy going to rage. I think it'll rage anyway. But to minimize it, at least to satisfy a greater percentage of the American people that are satisfied right now, I think you need to make certain that that board that's selected by the uh, Court of Appeals of Washington, D.C. is one that has uh, uh, a uh, fair credibility with the American public. And in that regard, in the bill, there is no criteria for who will be selected. Evidently, it's a nonpartisan board. Uh, who has never had any involvement with any of the investigations previously uh, or um, involvement with the government. Now, that's kind of hard to find in of itself. But uh, why wasn't there written into the bill some kind of uh, guidelines as to who the uh, Court of Appeals would select? Uh, uh, Mr. Martinez, uh, <coughs> you, you raise an excellent point. And, and the reason that I've taken the position as I did uh, in response to Mr. Horton's question that that uh, we should let these appointments take place under a court rather than by the President of the United States is because in the resolution itself we have a section designated uh, which reads appointment. And it says the Division of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit established under Section 49 of Title 28 United States Code shall within 90 calendar days of the date of enactment of this joint resolution appoint without regard to political affiliation five distinguished and impartial private citizens none of whom are presently employees of any branch of the government and none of whom shall have had any previous involvement with any investigation or inquiry relating to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy to serve as members of the review board. So that's, that was the criteria we tried to build in to be sure that these persons would represent distinguished private individuals without political affiliation. No, I agree with you that I think that they should be those kinds of individuals and that that's important to their mission. Uh, in making sure that the, the general public feels that they've received as much information as they possibly can without uh, violating the privacy of individuals or without it, uh, uh, creating any security risks. Uh, let me ask you just one more question very quick, quickly. Uh, you know, you had mentioned in your testimony and originally when uh, you sent your dear colleague around on your, on your legislation, uh, I was intrigued by the fact that you ran out of time and money uh, and, but up till that time, you had released as much information as you could. The only information you didn't release was that that you didn't have time to release because of running out of time and money. Uh, 
in that when you did run out of time and money, had any, had the committee come to any conclusion at all as to uh, have a finding information or things that would have led you to different uh, findings in the Warren Commission? Uh, at the time that we concluded our investigation, um, we, we uh, ran into some scientific information. And based upon that scientific information, the committee uh, concluded that there was the probability of a conspiracy. And uh, based upon that scientific uh, information or data, we concluded that uh, there was another shot from the grassy knoll there in Dealey Plaza. And, and then, of course, of course, we utilized that evidence along with other evidence, supporting evidence, to come to the conclusion that there was the probability of a conspiracy. And that was at about the time that we concluded our investigation. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back and balance my Thank you very much. I notice uh, my friend, the gentleman from Minnesota, is here, Mr. Colin Peterson. Do you have any questions of the witnesses, sir? Uh, no, I just want to thank you for uh, holding the hearing and uh, tell you that I support your legislation and I hope that we can uh, provide the fullest disclosure for the American people. Thank you so much. Uh, the gentleman from New York. Uh, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to include in the record at this point the um, names of the people who were members of the uh, war so-called Warren Commission um, and then also the name of the general counsel J. Lee Rankin, the assistant counsels, um, one of whom will be testifying later, Howard P. Willens, W-I-L-L-E-N-S, uh, who was also a uh, liaison between the Commission and the Department of Justice and then the various staff members of that Warren Commission, so we'll have it in the record at this point. Without objection, so ordered. And, Thank and you. also, Mr. Chairman, uh, I noticed that uh, Chairman Stokes didn't um, read all of his statement. I would assume that we could put the rest of his statement in the record. At, uh, yeah, I in suppose in, in the interest of time, uh, yeah, I, I had, uh, had, had just shortened my statement, Mr. Chairman. I would ask unanimous consent that yes. my full statement be made a part of the record. Without objection, all the statements of all witnesses will be here. Well, Mr. Stokes, you, you've uh, done us a signal honor by crafting the first bill to go through. And now if you can keep the president from vetoing or even threatening to veto your legislation, you will have uh, earned your spurs uh, all the way. Uh, Ask permission for Mr. Blakey to make one statement to you. What's it about? <laughs> I only have uh, one request and, and one comment, Mr. Chairman. I provided the staff a uh, an outline of the recommendations. Turn, turn the mic on. Turn the mic on. I provided the staff an outline of the recommendations and findings of both the Warren Commission and the uh, Select Committee on Assassinations, and I would ask that that uh, be. No. Sorry, we looked at it and we don't like it. Okay. We're not, we're not going to include it in the record, and I'm sorry you asked. Okay. Thank okay. you very much, Thank Chairman Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Chairman. The next witness is Oliver Stone, one of our most uh, successful film directors, a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I... No, what we're not including in the record, just since we're interested in disclosure. You can see it. It's back here. I, we, we looked at it already. Uh, I'll send it down to you. I, I can't put it in the record and then take it out. Uh, but I'll make it available to you, okay? Thank you. Oliver Stone is a, uh, well, I don't know whether he's a director, screenwriter, producer, or all three. And... Uh, we would like him to uh, come to the witness table at this time and, and stop obstructing the progress of Congress. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Stone. We have your prepared statement. You are probably the reason that we're all here today. Uh, and you've uh, moved the country and your Congress to uh, immediate activity with reference uh, to the subject matter that brings us here today. We welcome you before the Government Operations Committee. It's our honor and pleasure to have you as the next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a prepared statement, which you have for the record, uh, which I may vary from slightly, 
uh, I may improvise as directors sometimes do uh, as I read. Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the uh, subcommittee, my name is Oliver Stone, and I assure you it is with pleasure and some pride that I appear before this subcommittee today to urge the passage of House Joint Resolution 454, quote, to provide for the expeditious disclosure of records relevant to the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. I am proud to be here, Mr. Chairman, because I think it is reasonable to suggest that my most recent work the motion picture, JFK, may, in its reception by the American people, have played some role in creating the state of public opinion from which House Joint Resolution 454 has emerged. The murder of President John F. Kennedy remains, after nearly 30 years, the crime of the century. And for the overwhelming majority of Americans, it is the unsolved crime of the century. A hastily assembled commission of wise men, chaired by the Chief Justice of the United States and is consisting entirely of government insiders, was assembled shortly after the assassination of President Kennedy to study the evidence and offer public opinion a verdict Americans would find acceptable. That verdict, that President Kennedy was killed by a lone, deranged communist gunman, who was himself killed two days later while in police custody by another lone, deranged gunman, seemed incredible when published and has proved more so with each passing year. Most Americans did not believe or support the verdict of the Warren Commission initially, and now more than three in four, according to all recent samplings of public opinion, think some conspiracy was involved. The Warren Commission, concerned as it was only with who and how, never answered, never attempted to answer the question of why John F. Kennedy was killed. Obvious connections, Lee Harvey Oswald's to intelligence organizations and individuals, Jack Ruby's to organized crime, were uninvestigated and un unexamined. And so from day one, the mainstream media of the United States, our major newspapers, magazines, networks, reporters, columnists, and correspondents accepted the official verdict and never began, let alone pursued, an investigation. Hard as it is to believe the crime of the century in which the preliminary verdict was widely disbelieved and discredited was never seriously investigated by any major journalist or journalistic organization in America, even those priding themselves on their existence as, quote, newspapers of record or centers of investigative journalism. And thus, the official media joined official government in a decision to stonewall the American people, partly through lethargy and in part, an important part, to protect their own record of inaction and bland acceptance of the unacceptable. And so, Mr. Chairman, when Warner Brothers wholeheartedly supported against urgings by those very media defenders of orthodoxy and silence to suppress my film, The Making of JFK, Americans finally confronted on the screen the fact that most of the records which could have yielded a different verdict, CIA, FBI, military and naval intelligence, the files of the investigation by this body's select committee on investigations, all these were sealed from public view for 50 years. So it was no surprise a movement began in this House, in the Senate, and in public to open those files to permit us to try to find out the truth we had so long been denied. What were Lee Oswald's connections to American intelligence agencies? the CIA, the FBI, Army Intelligence, and the Office of Naval Intelligence. How was he permitted to re-enter the United States when he had renounced his citizenship, in his own words, to give secrets to the Soviet Union? How was he able, on almost no notice, to leave the Marines on a trumped-up excuse to go to the Soviet Union almost immediately? What were his connections with CIA-involved white Russians in Dallas, or the anti-radicals in New Orleans like Guy Bannister, David Ferry, and 
Clay Shaw. Why did he distribute obviously bogus pro-Castro leaflets while headquartered in the same office in New Orleans as militant anti-communist ex-intelligence officers? How did he get the job in the book depository overlooking the very precise point in the motorcade where President Kennedy's car had to slow down to 11 miles an hour? How did he get the job only several weeks before? What kind of coincidence was that? How did Lee Oswald get the rifle under the alias Lee Heide uh, Heidel when he could have bought a rifle in any gun store in Texas without having a trace on it? Just what were Jack Ruby's ties to organized cr crime? And how could he, Jack Ruby, a private citizen known as a small-time hoodlum, enter the Dallas police station armed and confront and shoot without hindrance the guarded and manacled man accused of the most publicized crime in our history. And finally, why was President Kennedy killed? Since it has been established from other evidence that he was indeed embarked upon a course to change our foreign policy with respect to the Soviet Union, Cuba, and the nations of Southeast Asia, including a decision on paper to withdraw our advisors and send no combat troops into the military and moral quagmire of, uh, quagmire of Vietnam, was this the reason? Perhaps, Mr. Chairman, the files which are the object of House uh, Joint Resolution 454 will yield some or all of these answers. Perhaps not. But without this resolution, we shall never know. And in a free society, that is intolerable. The stone wall must come down. Now, I am aware, Mr. Chairman, the resolution will be criticized. Legal hair splitting by the Department of Justice and the Office of Management and Budget, part of arcane battles which really concern the propriety of the special prosecutor rules, may impede passage. The actual language of the resolution may have been drafted as too complex, but none of those objections can have a lot of weight with those millions of Americans. 15, 17 million Americans who saw JFK in movie theaters and millions more, maybe another 20 or 30 million, who will see it at home on video cassette and on television. Nearly all of whom are determined 50 years shall not pass before we can pierce the media's silence and learn the truth for ourselves. The people have spoken loudly and clearly the agencies who have stonewalled for decades may invoke that catchphrase of obstructionists and hiders of the truth, the magic words, national security. But Mr. Chairman, our enemy lies in ruins, and the danger some Soviet agent may learn something embarrassing to the CIA or naval intelligence is no longer important, if it ever was. It is only important to those who may be hiding something. Perhaps a handful of living people whose names are in these records may need protection for reasons of privacy. But that can be easily accomplished, and those names, if any, can be easily edited. Mr. Chairman, don't let the existence of thousands of pages of documents deter you from the course of openness and candor you have so strongly set. The technology exists to review those files swiftly and fully. If the task is undertaken by people who want the files open, it will be done quickly. If by those who want them to remain concealed, then lawyers can be found, petty arguments can be interposed, and journalists can be prompted to support those arguments to keep them sealed for another 50 years. I believe this is an idea whose time has come. Americans will support you as you move forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Stone. We have 74 co-sponsors on the bill at this present time, and we think that uh, a result of the initiation of these hearings, we'll soon uh, get the uh, required number. Uh, you are uh, a great American, and you've done your country a great service uh, as one who uh, enjoys and appreciates the power of film as a part of our culture. Uh, I uh, read more criticism than I see movies these days. And uh, the only question that I would like to put to you, 
And I, I didn't realize uh, when this first occurred to me that you would be before my committee sooner than I thought. Is, uh, did you over lionize Jim Garrison for some artistic reason or, or through your view of what you were doing with the drama there? Or did you, you really think he was as great a person as uh, he was, as, as I've been told he's represented in your film? I don't think I had the time in the three hour and eight minute movie to go into a biography of uh, Jim Garrison. The movie dealt with four storylines, Garrison's investigation in New Orleans, uh, the reconstruction of the event in Dealey Plaza, uh, Mr. Oswald's uh, background, and uh, the military industrial uh, theme that we introduced with the character name X based on Colonel Fletcher Prouty. So I had four themes and I had little time to dwell into some of the flaws and defects of Mr. Garrison's investigation, including many of the uh, wrong, wrong turns that he took. But I admire Jim Garrison. I've met him, spent time with him. I think he is a great American who has been much maligned. I think he's been libeled as, as, as equally as Lee Oswald has been libeled in this, in this matter. Mr. Garrison succeeded uh, in bringing three things to light. He liberated the Zapruder film through a, by subpoena, subpoenaing, uh, subpoenaing uh, Time Life and getting the film shown for the first time to the American public. Bootleg copies were made of that film. And I think the Zapruder film is the best smoking gun we have. Mr. Garrison also clearly showed the connections that Lee Oswald had to anti-communists in Dallas with George DeMoran Shield and in New Orleans with Guy Bannister, David Ferry, and the late uh, Clay Shaw. This is an important piece of work because, and it was supported later by the House Committee work, that Oswald was not acting uh, out on a limb someplace as a deranged communist, that he had ties to anti-communists. Thirdly, Mr. Garrison at the trial showed very clearly by the testimony of Colonel Fink that at the Bethesda autopsy, Colonel Fink and the other two doctors were not allowed to track the trace of the a neck wound in President Kennedy. They were told not to track that by military superior officers that were in the room with them. This is a significant piece of testimony because it is obviously violates the rules of a basic homicide investigation. Additionally, uh, through Jim Garrison's uh, work, we, we, we know from the Gemberling document and the reports of the FBI that there was a shallow wound found in President Kennedy's back, six inches below the uh, shoulder blade. That shallow wound uh, in its essence, uh, defeats the possibility of a magic bullet going through the back and coming out the throat. That, among other things, is some of the work that Garrison has contributed. Well, for uh, a person who had uh, several storylines at the same time, I think you gave that a, a great deal of consideration, and I appreciate your response very much. Mr. Horton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stone, um, I want to commend you also um, um, for your direction of the movie and uh, for preparing the movie and making it possible. Um, I also think that it's a good thing that um, attention has been uh, brought to this subject. Uh, as I indicated, I was one of the original co-sponsors with um, Mr. Stokes, along with Mr. Conyers, of the uh, resolution. and. As you've heard me say here today, I feel it's very important that we move forward with the resolution and that uh, the President sign it. We get on with the business at hand. Um, for your information and, and others, um, there are some people who think that um, the release of the material should be looked at by, by others and then interpreted. Um, that's not my feeling. My feeling is that it ought to be released and then uh, let happen what happens. Let people interpret uh, what happens. So I'm for, for releasing it um, and uh, I commend uh, former President Ford for his uh, quickness to um, take the same position that we should release this material as quickly as possible and I hope as a result of Mr. Ford's uh, efforts that um, the President and the administration will cooperate with us and move forward with this uh, legislation so that it won't be controversial and it won't end up by being vetoed because I think that would be very unfortunate. I think the material ought to come out. Uh, with regard to the movie, um, um, what, um, what uh, information did, uh, did uh, you um, 
uh, have available to you? Uh, were you just dealing with press uh, releases or um, testimony from Mr. Garrison? Or uh, what, what type of information did uh, you have? And was it based on factual uh, material? Uh, we based our movie on uh, Mr. Garrison's book on the Trail of the Assassins, which details his investigation and the problems he had. As you know, he was for open government back then in 1967 through 9. He subpoenaed Alan Dulles, ex-chief of the CIA, and uh, Charles Cabell, Richard Bissell. Those subpoenas were squashed once again by the Justice Department. Uh, uh, Mr. Garrison tried to run a trial in the light of day. His office was bugged. Uh, he was bribed. Uh, the, the media essentially made him, I think, into a non-person uh, and uh, ridiculed him, and he has suffered from that libel for more than 20 years. Uh, we based part of the movie on the book by Jim Morris called Crossfire, which is a compendium basically of the research done by, public, uh, by private individuals, people without money, who formed over a course of years a small network of 12 to 20 people who communicated with each other, starting with people like Sylvia Marr, who wrote the book Accessories After the Fact, which examined in detail the Warren Commission contradictions. And it was this small network of private researchers that I believe have done the most serious and progressive work in the assassination, whereas I feel that government bodies from the Warren Commission on down have stagnated in their investigation into this area. We also based uh, the film in part on Warren Commission sources and public sources uh, that we could find, including living witnesses who came to our attention, people who were in Dallas that day, people who sent us letters, people who talked to us. Mm -hmm. We did our homework conscientiously. Uh, of course, we were at one point, we could not go further than we could because Many of these files, as you know, were sealed to the American public in the 1960s and were never opened. And the Warren Commission information was always uh, compromised by the fact that the CIA, the FBI, military intelligence never gave any significant information to the Warren Commission members. And in fact, the Warren Commission was chaired, uh, was one of the members of the Warren Commission was Alan Dulles, who had been fired by President Kennedy as the chief of the CIA. There seems to be the element of the fox investigating the chicken coop here. Among some of the records that we were dying to get hold of in order to uh, elaborate on our f uh, theories in the film are the testimony to the House Committee of people like Santos Traficante, Richard Case Nagel, William Sullivan, who was the uh, Chief of Covert Operations in the FBI, Atlee Phillips, who was a CIA agent, uh, Delphine Roberts, the Secretary to Guy Bannister, uh, Marina Oswald, Wally Weston, uh, George DeMorin Shield, who testified, uh, Dean Andrews, William Walter, the Dallas doctors, the Bethesda doctors. We, we have uh, more than 47 hours, uh, 43 hours of Cuban exiled interviews that were done that we don't have access to. 47 hours of something called JFK hearings. We don't know what's in those 47 hours. Frank Sturgis, Joseph Miltier, uh, still living, uh, Richard Helms, Admiral Berkeley, H.L. Hunt, CIA agent at that time, uh, Warren DeBreeze, an FBI agent in New Orleans at that time who knew Oswald very well, who is still living, Robert Webster, another defector who defected to the Soviet Union and returned a month before Oswald to this country, a pattern similar to Oswald's, Ruth Payne, who uh, knew the Oswalds very well in Dallas, all these names that you're mentioning, uh, the ones that are living, did you contact them or some no, of your representatives? No, none of these people would talk to us. With the gentleman you yes. to me, I, <clears throat> well, first of all, I see Professor Blakey is back in the room, and I want to apologize to him and tell him that uh, on reconsideration of the statement that he submitted, it will be uh, accepted into the record. And then I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Stone, uh, this question, sir. What, what is your theory of the John F. Kennedy assassination? Contrary to uh, the many misrepresentations you've read in the press, that I have postulated some massive conspiracy where 4,000 people get together at a convention in Miami Beach and call for the murder of the president, if you look 
at the film closely, which is quite possible now that the video cassette is coming out and you can have a second viewing in your home and pause and stop and actually listen to what people are saying, you will find that there are essentially two conspiracies are hy hy hypothecated. The first one, a conspiracy to kill the president, which is very small and covert in nature. I can see as little as five to ten people being involved in it. I think it was done in a very sophisticated manner where people who, if they are living, would not even know the names of the people that gave them the orders to do it. Uh, I, think it could, I think it came, it had to come from an element in government that was practiced in this art of assassination. Uh, the only people with that sort of experience are obviously the intelligence agencies who had been doing it abroad in the 1950s and, uh, in, and uh, in the early 60s. I think that that expertise was brought home into America and I think that we should look closer at the Operation Mongoose because that was essentially a paramilitary unit on the, in these shores uh, run by uh, uh, Colonel Lansdale or General Lansdale and in it we have all the realistic uh, equipment, men, manpower to, uh, with which to accomplish uh, something of this scope. Uh, we should look, uh, the House and the Senate should look at the Operation Mongoose files, it should be open. There's a second conspiracy I, I hypothecate, and that is the conspiracy to cover it up. And that cover-up, I believe, has been going on for 28 years and most recently expressed itself in the vehement attacks and misrepresentations on my film. That cover-up, I believe, involved people like Lyndon Johnson. I think the appointment of the Warren Commission was a means by which to derail a serious homicide investigation which was never accomplished. A trial should have been held in Texas. The body should have been examined in Texas by, and as we know, the Bethesda autopsy through the investigation of James Garrison, we know that autopsy was a compromised, if not a rigged affair. Uh, the cover-up extends, I believe, to the FBI and Mr. Hoover, at that time chairman of the FBI, Mr. Hoover's, let's say, uh, to, to use a euphemism, open dislike or for, for the Kennedys. And I think it extends to people in the Warren Commission, such as Alan Dulles whose motives, I think, are subject to scrutiny. Uh, but I don't think necessarily that the people involved in the cover-up were people involved in the conspiracy to kill him. What I did in the movie was show a paradigm of possibilities. I showed a president that deeply divided the country, made many enemies through policies against, uh, uh, and uh, intended to end the Cold War. His American University speech, I think, is an eloquent testimony by an American president to ending the Cold War, signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. It was a major breakthrough. Uh, backdoor negotiations with uh, Fidel Castro, a warming relationship with, president, uh, with the Premier Khrushchev of Russia, a strict no-combat policy in Laos and in Vietnam, a no-combat policy in Cuba on two occasions, Bay of Pigs and uh, prior to the missile crisis of October 62. Uh, I think we have a president that was moving on many fronts to, ra uh, to rock the boat, to shake the establishment. Mm -hmm. And I think we must look there for the root causes of people who were, if not involved in assassinating the president, were certainly relieved to see him go. Thank you so much. Now, could I just f finish up with this one point? Uh, Justice Warren was the chairman of, of his commission. Uh, do you feel that in your theory, he was involved in either of the two conspiracies? Uh, I had one slight misstatement I would like to correct. I said H.L. Uh, Hunt when I met Howard Hunt. H.L. Uh, okay. Hunt is a private citizen. Howard Hunt was a government employee. He was a CIA agent who was uh, involved, as you know, with Watergate. So we I would we like had to both of them statement. before the committee, so... Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, yes. would you, you give me your impression or your yes. thoughts as to the uh, possible yes. involvement of either of the conspiracy theories on the part of the late uh, Chief Justice Earl Warren? No, sir, I do not believe that uh, Justice Warren was involved in either conspiracy. I do believe, in a, I do believe that an inordinate amount of pressure was brought to bear on Justice Warren to take this job. Uh, by accounts of the journalists that, have met, that knew him during this period, he was an older man and partially senile. Uh, there is a, a written account of President Johnson's meeting with him 
uh, where President Johnson used the terminology of, if you don't take this kind of job, we are looking at a situation where World War III is possible. Forty million lives are at stake. Uh, Earl Warren did not want it. I gather that President Johnson pressured him. My particular belief, if you care to know it, is that President Johnson said something of this nature to Earl Warren. He said, look, Oswald extends to Cuba. This thing goes to Cuba. If the American people find this out, they're going to want to invade Cuba or they're going to want to take some kind of vengeance on Fidel Castro. If that happens, the Russians are going to come in and we're going to be on another World War III situation as we were 11 months ago at the, uh, during the October missile crisis. The American people were tired of the possibility of war, scared of it. It was better to keep this in the closet and find Oswald to be the lone assassin and let the story end there. And I think that President Johnson not only told this to Justice Warren, I think he used this a very uh, palpable excuse uh, in talking not only to Justice Warren but to the major newspapers of the time because there was a, an appalling lack of investigation on the part of uh, New York Times, Washington Post, Time Magazine and Newsweek Magazine and CBS News and NBC News to investigate this matter. Thank you, Mr. Um, <clears throat> Just a couple of more questions. Um, did you attempt to uh, get some of the material that you referred to earlier um, that was held by the, um, uh, by the administration or some of the agencies of the administration? Uh, we, have, uh, we have used the services of the, uh, the archive, the, uh, I, I, the name escapes me, but basically Kevin Walsh is running the... Uh, Archives? What's it called? Uh, what? Huh? The assassination archives here in Washington, they've been trying for years with Freedom of Information Acts to get information out. We used their, uh, we used a lot of their work because obviously to make a movie we had a year's time span and in order to get Freedom of Information documents it takes a, a lot longer. We used also a lot of public, uh, private researchers have demanded this information. We used their information that they had. But we have not been able to talk to the people that I mentioned before. Uh, they do not want to talk to us. Uh, obviously, I feel strongly that an inquiry should be made on these living people, and they should be uh, questioned. Did you attempt to talk to uh, former President Gerald Ford before you made the movie? Uh, I think Gerald Ford has spoken very clearly about where he stands. He's written about it. As you know, he released a book even before, he released an article even before the Warren Commission was made public, uh, setting, the, uh, setting the tone of a lone gunman. Uh, President Ford's been very outspoken in, his, in the defense of the lone gunman theory and he's, I, th I believe he's made public everything he knows. But, but did, you, did you attempt to speak? No, sir, we did not. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any further questions at this point. Thank you very much. The Chair is pleased to recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Ray Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure to be here today on this important hearing. I can't help but reflect that in 1960 I was in Los Angeles when we uh, nominated President Kennedy uh, as the standard bearer for the Democratic Party. And his assassination was one of the truly trauma traumatic events of the century. Uh, I think that it is hard to know the questions, but I think we do know today the answer. The answer is to adopt H.J. Res 454 and to allow the American people full access to all of the information concerning this tragic event. I do want to commend you, Mr. Stone, for bringing the uh, problem to the attention of the American people and um, uh, simply to say that it is time that we move forward. I think uh, our colleague, Louis, Louis Stokes, has done a tremendous job of uh, preparing uh, information within the limits that were made available to him, releasing such information as he could at the time, and uh, providing that the rest of the information could be uh, released after 30 years. 30 years has passed. It's time to get the job done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stone. I, um, you make reference to uh, the murder of uh, President Kennedy is the crime of the century, which happened 30 years ago, and and I'm um, I'm just struck by the fact that uh, 
it's very hard for me to imagine really what national security issues are at stake and even candidly what privacy issues unless they're the privacy issues that affect people who after the murder were involved in the investigation and may feel embarrassed by what may come out about what was done or what wasn't done in the investigation. And I, I guess my, my first question is, uh, do you feel there would be many national security issues or privacy issues that would involve the withholding of much information? As I said in my statement, uh, Congressman, I, I feel that there might be exception, uh, some exceptions to the rule, but I essentially do not. I think that 98 percent of these uh, documents could be released today. I guess uh, my concern is, do you have concern that one of the uh, uh, means by which some information will be withheld would be that it was, would in fact embarrass individuals who are involved in the process of doing investigative work? That, in other words, they maybe should have done more and that I, they I, could, in fact, be embarrassed by what might come out, and therefore they should be entitled to privacy. Well, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think that the uh, House investigation, as well-intentioned as it was, went, it became a political football. Where Richard Sprague was uh, removed. Uh, Mr. Blakey uh, came in. Mr. Blakey has written books about his opinion on the assassination, tracing it back to the Mafia. Uh, we've had a public debate on, uh, we've had debates about this on television, but as you know, I find that the mafia theory has been one of the great red herrings in this case, and is a, once you get past the single assassin, single uh, gunman theory and you get into the area of conspiracy, as we know from the Frank Church hearings, the CIA has always used the, uh, the, the organizations like the mafia as, as a area for plausible deniability. And I think that we've run into that aspect of the case, and you're going to hear more of it as these hearings go along. And if we ever open these files, you're going to hear a lot of Mafia stories. But we must always look past the Mafia to who pulls the strings, who is more powerful. And, and we must look again at Frank Church's work and uh, Richard uh, Schweiker's work and look at the connection between the intelligence agencies of our country and the Mafia, because that is at the root of this problem. Um, I think that uh, the privacy considerations of individuals are far outweighed by the importance of uh, this murder and what it means for America. Questions such as, do we really have a democracy? Is the government truly accountable to the American public? Can the government just make records known when they want to the American public? These are fundamental questions, and it goes right up to today's problems with the many conspiracies that have surfaced in the 1970s and the 1980s. The American people feel that government, fear that government may once again thumb its nose at them by filtering this legislation through many oversight committees and uh, much uh, bureaucratic red tape. One of the things I hear you saying, in, in essence, is even if there is a privacy issue, that the, the public right to know would overweigh that, even if, in fact, some people would be embarrassed in the process. Which leads me to, uh, to just make a comment and, and a question. Um, I've never been in, in a hearing in this chamber where we've had 16 cameras, and it shows the power of, of the media which you were involved in, uh, uh, esp especially done as effectively as you have done. And I thought how, what a shame it was that you didn't have access to information because it seems to me you had to rely on what you had that was documented fact and then you had to make a, you had to speculate and you had a lot of speculation in your film which obviously made it interesting but uh, I, my question is if you had had access to greater information and the information had suggested other directions uh, would you have uh, uh, sought to, to go in those directions or were you pretty much um, focused on this on the theories that you presented no, sir. Uh, as I went along, I learned quite a bit. Uh, this was a process that took almost two years of research and reading, and information was coming into us at all times. I cannot tell you the amount of people that approached me in dark alleys or in the, through phone calls and gave me information. I never even saw the linkages to President Kennedy and the origins of the Vietnam War when I started this movie. 
uh, the uh, NSAM 263 and 273 came to my attention through the historian's work, uh, John Newman's work on JFK and Vietnam. So when you started out making this movie and you learned more about it, did some of the conclusions in the movie uh, change? Some of the directions change based on information that came Absol to you? Absolutely. Colonel Fletcher Prouty, who worked in, who's a patriot, worked in our government for 30 years, who resigned in 1964, added a substantial amount of information that I was not aware of and is not in Jim Garrison's book. Also, Jim Garrison did not have the benefit of a lot of this information we got in the 1970s and 1980s. What I find interesting in the assassination is that, as far as the American public is concerned, with the 500 books that have been written about it, the information has come to us in fragmentary uh, manner through the years. We have a piece of information in 1968, another piece that emerges in 73, 75, 78. I, have yet, I think the movie performed a service by putting together into one mosaic uh, all, the, informa all the, the best information we have to contradict the Warren Commission. And uh, that was never available to the American people until the, this I, movie. I guess I just conclude by making this comment. It just, to me, illustrates another reason why it's unfortunate this information wasn't available, because I'm sure that if you had had access to s information that is now not disclosed, that uh, you would have been able to provide other information that would have been helpful and interesting. Well, I think you could also argue that if the information had been made public in 1968 and 5 and 6, that movies would have been made in 1969, because it would have been an explosive revelation. Uh, we wouldn't have had to wait 28 years to make this movie. Right. I, I, I would say I'm not sure if I would disclose everything at that moment in time, but certainly much sooner than 30 years, and certainly it should have been disclosed uh, soon enough so that uh, justice would have been done. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays, for your thoughtful comments. Uh, Mr. Steve Schiff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Stone, I hope you'll pardon the analogy, but I've been struck with remembering that President Lincoln once introduced Harriet Beecher Stowe, who of course wrote, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin as, this is the lady who started the Civil War. And of course the President was making a, a reference to the impact of a mass distributed idea, then limited of course to a book. And uh, I think it applies here, because I think that uh, even more powerfully with a movie of course, um, one can agree or disagree with your theories, and I think you yourself call them hypotheses. You, you, you've, you've advanced them as possibilities. Uh, the problem is we're debating them in the dark. Uh, is there, was there more than one gunman? If there was more than one gunman, that suggests a, a conspiracy. Whose conspiracy? And then after the fact, was there uh, a, a pressure on the Warren Commission to substantiate a one gunman theory, no matter what else was out there? Uh, all of this is unknown. Uh, it may, as you said, always be unknown. But again, I want to say 30 years after the, after the fact, I think it's time that all of this information came out and then the uh, theories can be debated and perhaps all but, uh, all but one put to rest. And I want to commend you for being here and testifying today. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Schiff. Uh, Mr. Martinez. Uh, there's... Uh some more thoughts that occur as, as my colleagues are asking you the questions and one that comes to mind is because I realize in every investigation there are people that come forth not with reliable information, not with factual information and if a person has a preconceived notion going in what he wants to prove and what he wants to accomplish uh, he's not going to be the most objective person to evaluate that that comes forth and I'm just curious uh, I don't know if you had a preconceived notion when you began the investigation or not, but, but when, what I'd like to know is that when a lot of this information came to you, uh, did you have some way of uh, evaluating that information and determining and evaluating the individual uh, and determining whether or not this was something that was reliable information that you could uh, put in your movie that would then go out to the American public because you see there's another question here is what the media does to the uh, American public in, in persuading them to think a certain way. Uh, I have never underestimated the power either of the uh, entertainment media or the news media to influence and sway people in the way they think. Very much so that many people uh, will inherently read whatever they read and believe it instantly and then, it, even if other facts come out later to disprove the first belief, they are hard-pressed to change their minds. 
So my question really is, when you were in trying to be as honest in your movie as you possibly could and still keep the dramatic value of it, did you have a process of evaluating those people that came forth with information? Uh, sir, I evaluated everything and if we're, I think in every case I always had a second source for every fact as stated in the movie. Where I speculated the characters, if you watch it closely, say maybe, what if, let's speculate, shall we? I used that kind of dialogue, that kind of language. Um, I also should, I'm sure you know that when the assassination occurred, when the assassination occurred, uh, many people in Europe and all over the world doubted uh, the cover story that was put out that afternoon by 5.30. The press had us believe that Lee Oswald gave us the complete profile of Lee Oswald before he was even charged with the murder of the president. Uh, at 5.30, he was charged at 12.30 that night. At 5.30, a profile of him as a lone nut, deranged communist was in the, pre was in the press and it was worldwide. Colonel Fletcher Proud, he read about it in New Zealand. I'm sure if, if you were in Ethiopia or, or Germany, you read the same story. It was a wire story. Colonel Prouty uh, confirmed to me uh, many uh, of these suspicions that this was a black operation. This was, an, it was run by intelligence. And Colonel Prouty has a long and distinguished record in our government. And he knew people like Alan Dulles. And he was, a, I think, a very strong second source to people like Jim Garrison and Jim Mars in his book, Crossfire. Uh, we threw out a lot of information that was spectacular and sensational out of the movie. I think we could have created even more fireworks. We could have gone one step further. There is much evidence to point, points pointing to the fact that Lyndon Johnson made a phone call to the chief of police of the Dallas, uh, Will Fritz, to tell him that he had his man. We now know from Charles Crenshaw's revelations, number one bestseller this week, that he was a doctor at Parkland Hospital, that President Johnson called when Oswald was on the table, uh, dying, and asked if the li last rites could be attained, a confession could be obtained from Oswald. Many of this, piece, many of this information was available to us, but we, we did not use it because of its sensationalistic nature. We tried to be responsible, and we tried to get second sources on everything we had in the movie. Well, thank you, Mr. Stone. You're to be commended uh, because you have brought to light uh, uh, certain events that uh, maybe escaped the public before that have caused them to have the curiosity to want to know more. So I commend you. Uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Colin Peterson. No comment. Uh, last question goes to Frank Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Stone, uh, if this material is released, and I hope it is, do you intend to make another movie? <laughs> I would hate to have to be in a position where I would have to make a film called MLK uh, to release, uh, to get released the files on Martin Luther King, which as you know is also part of the uh, HSCA files. The 850 boxes, uh, I believe, contain much of the Martin Luther King material, and I think it should be similarly unsealed. Uh, there are certainly even fewer national security considerations involved and no possible, no possible foreign policy consequences in the Martin Luther King case. I realize it might be distracting to seek to amend uh, House Joint Resolution 454 to include the... Let's don't, let's don't include that in this one. I mean, uh, we really... Uh, I have no problem with uh, moving forward on that, but uh, I really think that uh, for us to try to do that would uh, confuse the issue and create some real serious problems. Although I think it would be good if some kind of oversight mechanism could be established uh, in the legislature that cases could be looked at in the future, such as the Martin Luther King case, the Robert Kennedy case, the Richard Nixon Watergate case, because these are all part, I think, of a overriding and similar syndrome that has afflicted American politics since World War II. And I would urge the uh, committee to think seriously about our history and what has been told to the American people and to try to approach the type of glasnost that we have be, we've seen in the last few years in Eastern Europe. One other little uh, point, uh, kind of coincidental, it uh, so happened that while you were filming the, the part that you filmed in, in New Orleans, my wife and I were staying at the same hotel where uh, your star, Mr. Costner, was staying at, uh, in New Orleans at the time. Well, Thank you very much. Well, if I'd known that, Senator, I would, uh, Rep Congressman, I would put you in the movie. <laughs> Thank God you didn't know he was there. <laughs> <laughs>
we're, we're indebted to you, and I, I can say this on behalf of the entire committee, that we appreciate your contribution uh, to our country's attempt to become more open, uh, not just uh, in your artistic work, but in your very uh, thoughtful presentation here. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The second panel consists of two uh, attorneys who served as counsel to major investigations uh, surrounding the assassination of President Kennedy. One was on the Warren Commission, the other was on the Senate Intelligence Committee. I ask uh, Howard Willens and James Johnson to come forward. We welcome you gentlemen. We have your, your prepared statements that will be included in the record. We would appreciate if you'd summarize your uh, testimony and Mr. Johnson, counsel to Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, working under Senate, the late Senator Frank Church, we will invite you uh, to go first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is James Johnston. I'm a lawyer in Washington. Is your microphone on, sir? It says on. Well, pull it up closer. In 1976, I was counsel to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, chaired by Senator Frank Church and called the Church Committee. Its files on intelligence investigations into President Kennedy's assassination, as well as the Warren Commission files, will be open to the public by the joint resolution. While I have seen the classified files uh, in these two investigations, my testimony today is based on public reports. I strongly support opening these files. The Church Committee's investigation may be less well known than the others, but in ways it may have been the most dramatic. <clears throat> it called three non-agency witnesses. Two of these witnesses were murdered, and a third witness was murdered before he could testify. Who were they? Uh, Mr. Chairman, one of the witnesses was Mr. Roselli. Another witness, the witness that was murdered uh, before he could testify was Sam Giancana. And the third witness, I'd prefer not to disclose his name. Thank you. <clears throat> the so-called secret files of the Warren Commission and the Church Committee are principally intelligence documents. There's no smoking gun that will contradict the finding that Lee Harvey Oswald killed the President. However, I strongly urge that these files be opened. I think it will create a, open a public process that will uh, permit the American public to look at these, this material and to decide for themselves whether Everything that was classified has been made available. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, so very much. We now, uh, and I want to agree with you that the Church Committee was exceedingly important. It did a very important service. It was done under very adverse and controversial circumstances. I commend you for your work on that committee. We, we now turn to uh, uh, Mr. Howard P. Willens. Uh, you're just about the only one uh, still around from the Warren Commission, and we're delighted to have you before the committee. Well, well thank, you, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is How Howard Wellens. I'm a member of a local law firm, and I appreciate this opportunity to appear uh, before the subcommittee to testify regarding H.J. Resolution 454. I appear here today as a former assistant counsel of the President's Commission on the Assassination of President Kennedy better known as the Warren Commission. At the time the commission was appointed by President Johnson, I served as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division of the United States Department of Justice. I was asked by the Assistant Attorney General and the Deputy Attorney General to assist the commission in getting organized and performing its responsibilities. As in the military, when you're asked to volunteer, I volunteered uh, to assist in this mission. I worked full time for the commission and as liaison to the Department of Justice from December of 1963 until publication of the report in September 1964. It was an extraordinary public assignment that demanded the best efforts of all of us associated with the Commission. To the suggestion that the Commission was a group of insiders, I would remind the members of the committee that with the exception of myself alone, uh, every lawyer who worked for the Commission uh, was from private life. They were a diverse group of different backgrounds and political views, with different experience in the profession. They had distinguished credentials not then, and they've gone on to serve the public in a variety of respects uh, and in the academic community ever since. 
They had no motivation at that time or now to do anything other than comply with what the Chief Justice told us at our initial meeting when he said, truth is our only goal. I worked closely with the General Counsel of the Commission, J. Lee Rankin, who had served previously as Solicitor General for the United States and later served as Corporation Counsel for the City of New York. He had the difficult task of advising seven members of the Commission and supervising a staff of diverse, independent-minded, and often combative lawyers. The records accumulated by the Warren Commission during the nine months are, of course, uh, uh, the subject of this resolution. They are voluminous and varied. In my statement, I've identified some of the major categories into which they fall. They obviously include investigative reports of all kinds. They include internal analyses of those materials. They include memoranda to and from the Commission and within the staff. And they include draft sections uh, uh, with respect to the report that was ultimately published uh, by the Commission. Virtually all those records of the Warren Commission are now available for public, public scrutiny. The Warren Commission, in this respect, guide, guided strongly by its uh, four congressional members, decided to publish essentially all of the evidence uh, that the Commission relied upon in reaching its conclusion. I'm interested in the contrast between the decision that the Warren Commission made in 1964 with the decisions made subsequently by the several congressional committees uh, that investigated uh, one or more of the subject matters that uh, is before the committee today. The members of the Warren Commission appreciated the fact that they were assigned a historic mission that was going to be carefully scrutinized by the public and the world generally for decades to come. They made a decision to publish 26 volumes of exhibits uh, that followed shortly after the publication of the report. The members of the Commission and the, member of the, st the members of the staff then uh, and now uh, had nothing to be embarrassed about and felt that the interest of the American public was best served by publishing all of the documentary material and testimony upon which the Commission relied in reaching its conclusion. It's my understanding now, as a result of that publication many years ago and subsequent release by the National Archives, that only a small percentage of the documents uh, generated by the Warren Commission is not available for public examination. It has been suggested that, in fact, about 2 percent of those materials are not uh, in the public domain. Those have been, that have been withheld uh, include the autopsy photographs and x-rays, certain confidential investigative sources and informants, certain facts and procedures relating to presidential protection, and fully investigated allegations of complicity that raise questions of privacy. I've attached uh, to my statement correspondence with the National Archives that describes for the benefit of the committee some of the categories of material that are in the National Archives possession and have not yet been released. I know I speak for all the members of the Warren Commission staff, of whom there still are a fair number surviving, uh, in urging the expeditious uh, and comprehensive disclosure of all documents uh, relating uh, to the assassination of President Kennedy. On January 30 of this year, some dozen of us wrote a letter to the National Archives urging release of all Warren Commission material. Attached to this statement are copies of the letter that I signed on behalf of my colleagues, the press release explaining our request, and his very forthcoming response of February 7, 1992. As you might expect, this effort, as indeed uh, this committee's hearings, uh, uh, were precipitated in large measure by the controversy generated uh, by the movie uh, JFK. We all recognize that public disclosure of assassination materials will not end debate about the findings of the Warren Commission or the House Select Committee. Former members of the Commission staff remain confident of their work and are able and willing to participate in that debate, as evidenced by David Bellin's recent speech at the National Press Club that I'm attaching uh, uh, to my statement. I, I, I think in this, this connection I would like to read one, one paragraph from our press statement uh, of earlier this year uh, that was attached uh, uh, to my statement. It reads as follows. Based on all the evidence, we, the members of the Warren Commission staff, remain convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Lee Harvey Oswald alone fired all the shots that killed President Kennedy and Officer Tippett and wounded Governor Connolly. 
There were no shots other than the shots fired by Oswald. Jack Ruby was not involved in any conspiracy to assassinate President Kennedy or silence Lee Harvey Oswald. Based on the record as a whole, there was no credible evidence of any other domestic conspiracy or any conspiracy by the CIA or any other government agency or group or by any foreign government or by anyone else." End quote. There was nothing that I've heard today that causes me to, to want to modify that statement uh, in, in, any, in any respect. Um, Mr. Well, that, that means that you uh, disagreed with almost everything that the previous witness said. Uh, that is essentially correct, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, uh, except I would uh, uh, support the privilege that Mr. Stone has uh, to write a movie if he w wishes to, uh, uh, based on allegations, suspicions, uh, alleged conversations between two distinguished public servants, both of whom are now conveniently deceased. And I believe that he's entitled to do such a movie, but as a historian, there is no fact that has come to light uh, since the Warren Commission that undercuts any of the fundamental conclusions uh, that I have just uh, summarized on behalf of the uh, commission. telephone call that President Johnson made to the uh, Dallas police. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know if there was a telephone call or not, but I, I, I would uh, uh, suggest to, to the committee... Well, what if there was one? Uh, if there was a telephone call, uh, Your Honor, Mr. Chairman, if I may call you that, uh, uh, it is not evidence that the President or anyone else uh, uh, was... Uh, in the process of developing a, a, a cover-up with respect to the assassination of, of, of President Kennedy. We have to draw the distinction between allegations, suspicions, possibilities, and rumors on the one hand, and, and facts on the other. And that's essentially the point that I'm well, trying to make. In other words, you don't believe there was a telephone call? I don't know whether there was a telephone call or not, Mr. Chairman. I have not seen the evidence uh, with respect to that telephone call, so I'm unable to make a reasoned judgment as to whether there was, and if so, what was his purpose, okay. and if so, what, who, who acted who with respect the four, to it. Who were the four members that were on the committee? The four members of Congress, Mr. Yes, Chairman? Uh, uh, Senator Russell and Senator Cooper, a, a Congress, uh, a Representative Boggs, and Representative uh, Ford. Mm -hmm. Those were the four members of Congress. In other words, you don't believe there was a telephone call? I don't know whether there was a telephone call or not, Mr. Chairman. I have not seen the evidence uh, with respect to that telephone call, so I'm unable to make a reasoned judgment as to whether there was, and if so, what was his purpose, okay. and if so, what, who, who acted who with respect four, to it. Who were the four members that were on the committee? The four members of Congress, Mr. Yes, Chairman? Uh, uh, Senator Russell and Senator Cooper, a, a Congress, uh, Representative Boggs and Representative uh, Ford. Mm -hmm. Those were the four members of Congress uh, who were members of the, uh, of the commission. Well, well, now, what about the fact that the uh, House Assassinations Committee chairman himself has been troubled by the uh, uh, single uh, assassin theory? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm... I'm you don't think he uh, studied this carefully enough? No, uh, uh, quite to the contrary, Mr. Chairman. I think that the House Select Committee chaired by... Uh, 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 Mr. Stokes did a, uh, an admirable uh, job and that uh, Professor Blakey uh, did an excellent job. I testified uh, uh, in a deposition before that committee. The interesting point about that, Mr. Chairman, is that the House Select Committee confirmed each and every major conclusion of the Warren Commission with respect to the, the number of shots, the source of the shots, the so-called magic bullet theory, and the absence of any other assassin on the scene. There was one exception with respect to the acoustical evidence uh, that the uh, chairman made reference to earlier today. Late in the investigation, they had experts testify, based on an examination of, of, a, uh, of a tape, that there was a fourth shot at the scene, which thereby opened up, as clearly it might, the possibility of a second assassin uh, in Dealey Plaza. Right. The, the majority of the committee was persuaded by that evidence and they reached a finding, summarized by the chairman today, that that uh, presented probable evidence of a conspiracy. Three years later, Mr. Chairman, that acoustical uh, evidence uh, was the subject of a report by the Committee on Ballistic Acoustics of the National Research Council. That committee consists of private and public experts in the field. They examined the tape, all the available evidence, and they found no scientific validity whatsoever for the conclusion that there was a fourth shot at the scene uh, of the assassination uh, from any uh, uh, point whatsoever. In, 
Indeed, the 1982 definitive study found that the point on the tape where oscillating waves supposedly indicated the sounds of another shot actually occurred on the tape more than one minute uh, after the assassination. Now, it is, is my uh, 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 suggestion and conclusion uh, that there is a conflict uh, in the uh, acoustical evidence uh, and that uh, members of the uh, committee, uh, if they were confronted with this conflict in, in, in a scientific analysis, uh, might well think it appropriate to re-examine that conclusion. Well, do you think that uh, Chairman Stokes would be more comfortable in his bed at night if he heard your rebuttal evidence? He, he's well aware of it, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, as is uh, uh, Professor Blakey, and, and I think they have uh, uh, some reservations about the second study, uh, uh, but which are a fair, fair subject for debate, but I offer that uh, to the committee uh, as at least part of the technical record that has to be examined. Our conclusion with respect to the absence of another assassin, Mr. Chairman, is based on the entire record that the Warren Commission and other investigations had. The, the, the number of bullets uh, uh, found, uh, the fragments, the identification of the uh, weapon, uh, the uh, uh, eyewitness testimony, the absence of any testimony of a second assassin firing away uh, whose identity uh, 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 is not known and who was never seen and of uh, which uh, evidence of a bullet, uh, of another bullet there, there simply is lacking. But to, to the point is that uh, the Commission staff uh, uh, and, the, and the Commission reach conclusions. Others have reached different conclusions, but we support fully the objective of the legislation before this sub subcommittee because it is, after that. all. That brings us all together, and I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy that you come forward and, and indicate that uh, most, if not all, of your uh, staff uh, associates would uh, support uh, the same measure, and I, I think uh, Mr. Johnson, do you assert the same thing for those uh, people that you worked with on, at a staff level on the church committee? I most certainly do, Mr. Chairman. I think that uh, the people that have looked at these files uh, want to see them brought out in public. And uh, those of us who have seen them, we also know the intelligence agency's objections to bringing them out. Uh, I think that in a public process, for the most part, those objections should be uh, overridden and these documents should be made public. Well then, in, in uh, essence, uh, what, Mr. Willens, is your theory of the JFK assassination? I assume you're not talking about the movie. Uh, no, I'm I, talking I, about the assassination. Yeah, yeah, Mr. The Mr. Movie. Chairman, I, I, I repeat that the conclusions of the Warren Commission uh, reflect my views then and they reflect my views now, uh, that there are no facts as distinct from allegations and suspicions that undercuts any of the major conclusions of the Warren Commission. I find it incredible to believe that there was either a small, closely held conspiracy or a more widespread conspiracy of a cover-up that would have survived 28 years of examination and debate, uh, media investigations, congressional investigations, and so forth. It is my uh, uh, conclusion uh, that until there are facts, that come to light that the conclusions of the Warren Commission uh, remain intact and valid. You, you don't have any nagging doubts? Mr. Chairman, one of the things that the Commission and staff were very cautious about was to indicate the limitations of the information available to them and the kind of findings those, those would uh, uh, support. The Warren Commission could not conclude in 1964 for all time that there was no conspiracy. What they could conclude was that there was no evidence of a conspiracy that was presented to it at that time. So you do have some nagging doubts. It, when there are, with a, about a historical event of this significance, Mr. Chairman, there are always going to be reservations, suspicions, skepticism, and concern. I share the concern because I work for the Department of Justice. I care deeply about that administration. I reported to Attorney General Kennedy, and he cared deeply about the integrity and the comprehension of that investigation. Well, this is not to criticize uh, anybody, and certainly not you, but if you have nagging doubts because you could only base your conclusion on the Warren Commission, which could only base its work on agencies and information supplied to it, as a reasonably prudent lawyer, you're, you're perfectly entitled to have nagging doubts. 
I, uh, in other words, in this contact, context, nagging doubts is not anything to be ashamed of. No, I, I certainly am not ashamed either of having uh, uh, reservations, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I would point out, though, that there's a great misconception that the Warren Commission and staff were entirely dependent on intelligence or investigative agencies of the federal government. We had uh, direct access to individuals uh, who witnessed the scene. We had direct access to experts who were unassociated uh, with the federal government. We had the power of subpoena, which was exercised, and we had the full ability to conduct what was then the most comprehensive criminal investigation ever conducted in the United States. But you still have nagging doubts. If, if you're suggesting I have nagging doubts about the conclusion... No, I'm, I'm asking you. I'm, I'm not trying to put words in a uh, trial counsel's mouth. I mean, you know, you either have nagging doubts or you don't have nagging doubts. It's a free country. Uh, that's why Mr. Stone could make his movie. Right. Uh, and, and that's why you view. can have your nagging doubts. And uh, may I have my reservations? Uh, of course. Uh, about what the future will display. But I want to reiterate that there's been no facts that have come to light in the last 28 years that undercut any of those conclusions. All right. My time is just about up. Let me read these two sentences. Three. The Senate investigation revealed that the Warren Commission investigation was fundamentally flawed because of its reliance on intelligence agencies. They did most of the investigation and all of the intelligence collection and analysis. Unfortunately, they failed the Commission and the American public. Your comments? Uh, my, I, I disagree uh, with uh, that. Uh, at the same time, I acknowledge with my colleague here on the panel uh, that the commission was disserved by the CIA. I, I subsequently was... Well, they, they lied to you about trying to do in Castro. I, yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm deeply... And how many other t instances did they, de they either deliberately lie to you? Uh, I don't know, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that, and how that, many instances did they deny information so you couldn't even find out if they were lying or not? As, as the chairman suggests, it's very difficult uh, then and now uh, to know uh, exactly what the agency knew and to what extent they disclosed that to the commission. They did do some very excellent work for the Warren Commission. Well, last question. Do you think that Oliver Stone has done this country a disservice by stirring this stuff up? No, I don't think so, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that the, uh, Mr. Stone's uh, hypotheses uh, and allegations that he reiterated here today and set forth in the movie are for the most part false. I think that the uh, uh, movie uh, nonetheless uh, is, uh, addresses a public issue uh, that is uh, an appropriate one. It's, a, it's an artistic effort uh, and I think that bringing us together before this committee, uh, Mr. Stone has served a public service. Well, don't you deplore the fact that most Americans agree with the theories that are implicit in his movies? In his movie? I, I deplore the fact, Mr. Chairman, and I wish I could believe with the members of the committee uh, that disclosure of these underlying materials will, hope, will hopefully reduce the amount of debate or cynicism about government agencies like the Warren Commission. Well, I can tell you right now that the, uh, that the American people are disagreeing with your conclusions, I hate to tell you this, uh, by uh, large numbers as a result of this movie. I know that, Mr. Chairman. That was the case back in the 60s, indeed. I mean, I've made the point in private that the only people that agree with the Warren Commission reports are our mothers and our children. And uh, uh, some of my children are beginning to express doubt. Uh, uh, but the point I'm making is that there's a difference between allegations, suspicions, hypotheses, and movies on the one hand, and historical facts that are susceptible of probative evidence on the other. Well, you know, I listened very carefully to Oliver Stone, and he didn't sound like some kind of... Uh, Hollywood nut or somebody that was unprepared or that someone that hadn't spent an enormous amount of time uh, detailing uh, many issues. I thought he, I thought he made a, a rather impressive and compelling presentation before this subcommittee and I, I thought that you would have thought the same thing. 
my, my judgment on that, Mr. Chairman, is colored by at least two facts I would emphasize to this committee. Uh, first, Mr. Stone has refused repeatedly uh, to debate these issues uh, with informed members of the Warren Commission staff. God, Second, he, didn't, he didn't say that when he was here. Of course not. He said not. that's all he does is debate people. He, is, uh, he has denied and rejected invitations to debate these issues with Professor Wesley Liebler of the U UCLA Law School and for an assessment of the accuracy of Mr. Stone's uh, rumors and allegations, I suggest that the members of the committee read Mr. Bellin's speech before the National Press Club of a few weeks ago that I've attached to my statement. Could I invite Mr. Johnson to make any comments that he wishes about the foregoing discussion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wanted to jump in uh, on the question of did the CIA give Mr. Willens and the Warren Commission all the files? We were had the luxury to sit back and look at the CIA files in 1975 that we wanted to look at and then to say, did you show this file to the Warren Commission and let's see the proof of that. And it was at that point that we started discovering lots of material that was not given to the Warren Commission. Uh, the fundamental material that was not given, what it dealt with this plot to assassinate Castro, so-called Amlash plot where a high-level Cuban was meeting with the CIA at the very moment of the assassination of President Kennedy, and the CIA gave that man, gave Amlash, a poison pen to use to assassinate Castro. Now, this information was never given to the Warren Commission. Mr. Willens didn't know about it. None of these people knew about it. And it seemed to me that that was fundamental to their investigation. I say in my prepared testimony, cite the example, that the CIA learned that the man that Oswald met at the Soviet consulate in Mexico City, his name was Kostikov, he was a vice consul, was in KGB Department 13. And Department 13 of the KGB specializes in assassination. So the CIA was quite alarmed with that meeting that Oswald was talking to a KGB assassination expert. Now, Mr. Willens knew that. They told the Warren Commission that. The CIA investigators then said, we would like to see the na a name trace on all the people that Mr. Kostikov knows. We want to see what importance there is to this meeting. That name trace would produce all the names that the CIA had on the individuals that Kostikov knew. One of the names that showed up on that name trace was that of Amlash. Now, CIA investigators got the name of Amlash, that he was in contact with the Soviets in Mexico City. What they did not get, and what the Warren Commission did not get, was the fact that uh, Amlash was involved in a plot to assassinate Fidel Castro. Now, if you can put yourself in the position of the CIA investigators, this is before the Warren Commission was created. The CIA investigators on November 24, 1963, learned that if they had learned on that date, this is the day that Oswald was killed by Ruby, if they had learned on that date that the CIA had been meeting with Amlash to kill Castro, I ask you, would the assassination investigation have been different? And I think the answer is yes. And I go in in my prepared testimony to explain why various leads and, and uh, several important leads that were pointed towards Cuba were not pursued by the Warren Commission or the CIA. But let me finally stress the fact that there appeared to be conscious decisions by senior officials at the CIA, as well at, as well as at the FBI, to withhold information from the Warren Commission. In the case I've described of this name trace on, on in connection with Kostikov, uh, the testimony was that that uh, the information about the Amlash operation could only should have gone to investigators. That there had to be a conscious decision to withhold that information from investigators. So this is not merely a matter of oversight. I think we've had three official investigations of this Kennedy assassination. There are still classified files, and I want to stress again that I think it's time that these files be made a pu uh, public to the extent possible. Do you have nagging doubts about the single assassin theory? I, we, uh, I guess personally, yes. Uh, as a staff counsel of the Senate committee, we didn't look at the uh, events in Dallas. We didn't look for multiple assassins. Uh, I think in my testimony, I describe an individual by the name of Lopez who disappears, who looks very suspicious, and who, after the assassination, goes from Mexico City to Havana. Before the assassination, he's in Tampa, Florida, waiting for a go-ahead, and the president was appearing in Tampa, Florida, where this Lopez is located. 
and then Lopez disappears between the 20th of November and the 23rd of November, and we know he's in Texas. Now, the nagging doubt I, I've had is that maybe Lopez was somehow indeed connected with the assassination, as, as he was alleged to be, and was in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963, and that would present a, quite a different light on events. What about the people murdered before we could get to them? The, uh, I only have to say that this pure speculation as to whether or why they were murdered. Uh, however, the fact that Mr. Giancana was murdered before he testified before the Senate committee and that Mr. Roselli was murdered shortly after he testified, uh, that timing raises a great deal of uh, questions in your mind. Both these individuals were connected not with the Anlash operation, but with prior CIA attempts to kill Castro. Does the mafia, were the mafia lead actors, or were they just uh, people that regularly did business with the C Central Intelligence Agency? They did business with the Central Intelligence Agency uh, up until 1962, and the evidence we had is that they were cut off at that point. Uh, prior to that, they had had a relationship uh, with the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, especially, at least in the connection with Cuba. Thank you. Mr. Horton. Chairman, I uh, don't really have any questions. I think you've covered uh, a lot of the ground. Uh, one observation, though, is that um, the Warren Commission, and um, I want to commend um, um, Mr. Willens for his uh, testimony. Uh, one of the facts that we have to recognize is that um, this was a very traumatic experience in American history. and. Um, I know that the people that were appointed to the commission, uh, I personally knew Senator Russell and Senator Cooper, they're outstanding, both of them were outstanding leaders in the Senate. And uh, Hale Boggs uh, was a very outstanding person in the House of Representatives who, as you will recall, was killed in an airplane accident, body never been recovered uh, uh, in an air crash in, in, in Alaska, and of course uh, Jerry Ford went on to become President of the United States and highly regarded and respected. So um, they, were, they were dealing with, um, with a very volatile situation and uh, I know in the time frame, I was in the House and in the Congress at the time and in the time frame, they, they ran down every lead that they possibly could. I'm, I'm glad that we did uh, look at the subject later on. Uh, I think that we will probably find additional information as we get more of the uh, facts out and that's why I feel very strongly and I hope that uh, those in the administration who are expressing some concern uh, will remove that concern so that we can move forward to get this information out as quickly as possible. Well, the gentleman yeah. you know, for just a question to Mr. Willens. Uh, wasn't it Arlen Specter as a prosecutor that it developed the single assassin theory? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the uh, uh, Senator Specter was a member of the Commission staff. He was one of several members of the staff that wrestled with the evidence, uh, identified various alternatives, and ultimately, uh, along with all of us on the staff, concluded uh, that a, a, a single bullet uh, uh, did uh, generate uh, the wounds in both of the victims. In other words, you don't want to give him that dubious distinction. I gather it's become more of a dubious distinction since the movie, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And well, I look, I'm, I'm, I forget the movie. All I'm asking you is, did he do it? or did, he, Was that his contribution or not? If it wasn't, fine. He was one of the key members of the staff that contributed to that uh, a conclusion. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Well, of course, that was uh, what happened, and the commission came to that basic conclusion at that point in time when, when they um, um, made their, their um, report. Uh, there were, as I said, subsequent uh, investigations, including the one uh, Senator Church conducted, and then the one that was conducted in the House under the leadership of uh, Chairman Stokes. And as I said earlier, I'm sure that as a result of the uh, release of this material, there'll be others, and there'll be other um, uh, investigations into it. And I think that that's, that's good. I think we will, everybody wants to try to get to the, uh, to the basic facts. And I don't know that, that we ever will get to that, but we certainly ought to make the effort. And I think both of you, uh, certainly um, uh, with your colleagues uh, from both these commissions, 
have urged that uh, this material be released. Is that correct? That's correct, Mr. Orton. Yes, that, that's correct, Mr. Arden. So um, I think that's the point. Uh, that's that's the the uh, point that, that should be made here. Uh, and I also want to emphasize that the that the resolution adopted by Mr. Stokes is not a partisan resolution. It's a very bipartisan uh, resolution. Uh, Republicans and Democrats alike uh, feel the, uh, the material should be released, and I think that's what's been expressed here in, in this subcommittee uh, on numerous occasions today. So I want to thank each of you for your testimony and for the many hours, days, and weeks that you put into this effort uh, when, when you uh, were working on it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Thornton. Mr. Thornton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, I think we are faced with uh, witnesses coming before us to tell us uh, that there are questions. Um, uh, in this instance, uh, fewer unresolved questions. Mr. Stone raised a lot of questions. And we, in this committee, have the opportunity to provide at least a large part of the answer by passing, reporting to the floor, H.J. Res 454. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Shays. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Willens, I, um, I love your spirit, and I think I love your spirit more because uh, uh, it's not as popular to take your view. Uh, so I thank you for you know, being true to your beliefs and, and expressing them so strongly. Uh, but even, and it's not a but, uh, it's really just saying that, that the passion you feel makes me all the more uh, determined uh, to try to see this bill through because um, just the thought that somehow there is information withheld that would have people come to different conclusions uh, adds to the whole uh, tension and, and, and problem that I think exists. If all the information that is available is, is, is available to the public, it seems to me that is a positive step in having people come to their own conclusions. Uh, but you have information that I haven't seen. You came to conclusions based on that information that I haven't seen. And, um, and maybe I would come to the same conclusion. So I guess I'm struck by the fact that, that um, it must be very frustrating for you, given the information you have and the conclusions you've reached, to see uh, this film and to see the speculation that's being introduced. And I, and I, and I feel for, your, for the... Um, um, how difficult that must be, but it must also, I think, be would be co of comfort to you to know that this information would be out, and then no one could claim that somehow uh, the American people were deprived of this information. I certainly agree with that, uh, Mr. Shays. Uh, I wanted to make the point that, so far as the Warren Commission was concerned, 98 percent of the information generated by the commission is in the public domain. I agree with your. Uh, position and sentiments uh, that all the information relevant to the assassination of President Kennedy uh, uh, should be made uh, public. And that's why I'm here on behalf of the other staff members to support uh, uh, this proposed uh, a resolution. We have no uh, fear or concern about the debate that will result from that or the ultimate conclusions uh, that will be reached from that. And to the extent that I uh, have spoken with a passion and vigor, I apologize oh, I as it, it being a, a characteristic flaw. Uh, but that uh, uh, I think that I wanted to draw the distinction between facts on the one hand and allegations, rumors, and suspicions on the other. We will never be able to still those who want to add to the conspiracy literature. And I simply ask the members of this committee and the members of the public and the media at final day and point in time perhaps to concentrate on the facts. What, what that says to me, I, 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 I have a, a number of emotions. One is... Um, passion that's heartfelt is a welcome thing in this place. Um, but uh, to say that 2% is still not being given out, that could be the 2% that's the most important. I mean, it could be, I don't mean the smoking gun, but it could be that bit of information. So I, I think the percents are not all that relevant. Uh, let me ask you one last, I mean, relevant to say, well, you know, since 98% is, we don't need the other 2%. The other 2% may be what we really need more than the 98%. Yeah. Can I, say, I think you're right. I mean, I haven't seen that material. I think that you're right in, in your judgment that the 2 percent that's still classified may be more important now than the 98 percent that's out there. 
Now, I would just like to make one last comment because you said that the autopsy was one major bit of information that had not been made public. And my predecessor, Stuart McKinney, served on the committee that investigated. And I remember seeing him um, one weekend after he had viewed the, um, uh, uh, the pictures. And uh, he was absolutely adamant that no one ever should see those pictures. Well, the, the, the pictures uh, uh, are, are only one source of evidence about the autopsy, uh, as you know, and the, the autopsy photographs uh, uh, were and have been made available for examination by responsible uh, investigating agencies and by independent uh, and, and uh, qualified uh, forensic experts. So it's not as though uh, the photographs have been uh, concealed for all time. And in fact, I've heard, and I don't know if this is accurate or not, that some of the, the materials in Mr. Stone's film were, were drawn from those very same uh, 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 photographs. In other words, they have reached the public domain, whether uh, intended uh, uh, or not. Uh, but I, the, the point about the two percent is is a fair a fair point, uh, and and one of the concerns that members of the committee expressed earlier today uh, is right on point, namely that if the privacy and the national security exemptions in the proposed resolution are uh, are uh, interpreted too broadly, uh, there will always be the criticism that the two percent. Uh, uh, withheld is, uh, is the critical uh, body of evidence that unless the public sees, it, it will not accept uh, the conclusion. So the members of the committee are, are faced with a, the challenge of trying to favor disclosure to the fullest possible extent, honoring some concerns of privacy or national security, and perhaps recognizing that down the line, this resolution, if, if enacted, will still be the subject of criticism uh, because the American public uh, uh, will not have seen each and every uh, piece of paper that was generated by any agency investigating the assassination. In other words, instead of 2% being withheld, there might be 0.2%, and uh, that 0.2% might be the most important. It, 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 it might be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. Mr. Schiff. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Willens, I uh, want to say that I think that the, the point, one point Mr. Stone is making is that the Warren Commission, for whatever reason, was pre had a predetermined uh, goal of sustaining the one-shooter uh, one um, uh, assassination theory. I have to tell you, not as a member of Congress, but looking back 30 years ago, again as a student at that time, I had the same impression, and I'll tell you exactly what gave me that impression. I remember hearing a, 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 a debate on radio, and I grew up in Chicago, and this may have been produced in Chicago, it may have been national, I don't know anymore. That and the, uh, the um, a debate was between an attorney for the Warren Commission, whose name I don't remember, but a very, I remember the description of the gentleman as being a very prominent attorney, I believe perhaps from Chicago, if that rings a bell at all. Uh, I may be wrong about his, his uh, location. And I remember that the person on the other side of the debate was challenging the Warren Commission, and I think, and I may be misquoting, apologize if I am, I think it was Mr. Mark Lane was on the other side. And I remember, I remember the first attorney had a very prominent reputation because it was almost uh, half his responses were he had more experience than Mr. Lane, and therefore the implication being I shouldn't listen to, listen to a challenger. And second of all, when Mr. Mr. Again, I hope I'm quoting accurately. When the challenger of the commission brought up points, uh, questioning conclusions, what about this evidence to the contrary? The answer was invariably. Let us look at the positive facts which reinforce the conclusion of, of a single gunman. My point is the attorney for the Warren Commission never answered the individual points that were brought up, and it certainly left me with that with that impression. As I say, that's 30 years ago. Um, bring, it to, bring it to the current point, and then I'll let you respond if you wish, certainly in what I've said. Again, going back to Mr. Stone, I think he is to be credited, and I think you gave him that credit, for bringing the issue before the American people. I mean, his movie is why we're here today. No doubt about that. And I think that his point is one step further than the Warren Commission. I think that, again, if one assumes that the Warren Commission were directed towards an outcome that it might have had missed or not received or not even asked for information that would have been relevant because Mr. Stone cited not only what might have been remained in the non-public Warren Commission records 
but apparently voluminous records in the possession of other agencies, particularly the FBI and the CIA, that he never said were reviewed by the Warren Commission. So I think at this point, and I think you've said this, uh, we may or may not solve the debate as to who killed the president and why. Um, but we should put to rest the allegation that there is a cover-up, that there was in fact a preconceived uh, goal to cover up this matter and therefore uh, uh, I join you in calling for that full disclosure and as an attorney with the Warren Commission at a time when I was a high school student uh, I invite your response to the observations I had at the time if you wish to wish to offer any. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I grew up in the Chicago area, but I, I disclaim participating in that debate. Uh, uh, I, I do think it is a, a, a true, and, and, and that in a debate with respect to the Warren Commission uh, findings, uh, there is always the, the tendency on the part of a Warren Commission staffer to hold up the Warren Commission report and ask someone whether they've read it. And are you aware of the physical evidence, of the eyewitness evidence, of the ballistics examinations, of the medical testimony, and all the other evidence that produced a record from which conclusions had to be drawn and the exercise of a fair uh, a, a judgment uh, had to be, had to be uh, made? Uh, Prejudgment is a question that will always be uh, uh, debated, and I cannot speak for any individual member of the Commission. I can speak for myself and I can speak for my colleagues on the Warren Commission staff. Uh, this was a long time ago, but we had a staff of some very young, talented, ambitious lawyers. We had a staff that included some extremely uh, prestigious uh, uh, individuals. Uh, from that staff uh, has emerged one member of President Ford's cabinet, uh, 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 Bill Coleman. Uh, from that staff uh, has emerged two judges in Ohio and San Francisco two deans of law schools, five law school professors, and then a few people that just try to make a living of practicing law. Now, each of those staff members had no motivation to conceal, cover up, proceed in a hasty fashion. In fact, if they could have been able to disprove the uh, uh, one assassin theory, just think of the potential uh, that they would have had professionally and politically. There was no motivation other than to proceed aggressively with independence uh, and to do the best possible job. And, and that's why I, I, I know I can speak for the staff in, in, in saying that we pursued all the lines of inquiry. And I want to make it clear that I'm not condoning the CIA and the FBI. When I learned that the CIA lied to the Commission, and in fact me personally, because I was involved in some of those meetings, I was deeply and offended and I still am deeply offended and all that information should have been made available to the Commission and it might have influenced investigative leads. It may have influenced conclusions, although as I've said before, I've not seen any facts from any source to suggest that. So I, I, I respect your views. They were widely held. They are even more widely held today with respect to the Warren Commission report. And uh, uh, I ask uh, only that as the documents come out and as they're analyzed by impartial uh, people that uh, respect is given for the facts and judgments to fall where they may. I conclude at the risk of being somewhat repetitious what I've said and what others have said. Very simply, Mr. Stone offered some theories, uh, which he himself acknowledged are theories of, of the assassination and the following events. You've disagreed with those theories. It's obvious that uh, uh, the matter, although it may never be settled, the matter will continue to be in debate as long as the public knows that there's a volume of material in government control which the government hasn't made public. And that's why the chairman has held this hearing and why I think it will lead to a revelation of those documents. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Schiff. Uh, <coughs> Mr. Willens, uh, you, of course, remember your associate, Bert Griffin, now a distinguished jurist in uh, Cleveland, Ohio. I take it that you agree with Judge Griffin, who sent this committee a letter, urging that all documents generated prior to January 1 uh, on the Warren Commission be released unless it can be shown that disclosure would jeopardize the personal safety of a particular individual. 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, I received a copy of uh, Judge Griffin's letter and I attached it to my uh, statement. I, I think uh, it's a very important point that with the passage of time, the presumption ought to be in favor of disclosure and the burden ought to be a very specifically defined on anyone who wants to withhold information of any kind of, of that uh, uh, age. Thank you. Would you agree with that uh, statement, Mr. Johnson? Yes, I would. In fact, as I've urged, I think the national security uh, exemptions for this material should be very narrowly construed, and I personally would come down more in favor of any privacy kind of notions for this material, but, but in terms of uh, this classified material, sources and methods, intelligence secrets, uh, I think that that generally should be overridden uh, in releasing this material. Gentlemen, on behalf of this committee, we're deeply indebted to you, not only for your testimony today, but the many, many weeks, months, years that you've put in on this subject matter. We thank you very much. Thank you, thank Mr. Chairman. The final panel consists of Dr. Parmet, Leslie Harris, and uh, Dr. Rillier. If you would come forward now, join us at the witness table. Leslie Harris is Chief Legislative Counsel for the Washington Office of the American Civil Liberties Union, and we will ask her to begin this discussion, followed by Dr. Parmet of uh, Queensborough Community College, a distinguished professor of history and has written several volumes on uh, President Kennedy, and then Dr. Harold Rillier, a specialists in the American national government with the Congressional Research Service. Uh, lady and gentlemen, we welcome you all. Ms. Harris, please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to testify on behalf of the ACLU. Of course, we've had a long-standing interest in the release of all sorts of documents to the public, and uh, we see this uh, as a, a piece uh, of our larger uh, concerns. We strongly support this legislation. We do have some suggestions for amendment. Given the lateness of the hour, I think I just want to focus on a couple. Uh, before I do that, I, I do want to comment on one specific provision, which we think goes to the heart of this legislation. That's the right of Congress to enact legislation which sets a standard and a procedure for release of information, which the executive branch has classified on national security grounds. I'm going to remind the executive branch that there, there is a, a legislative role in this uh, well. A particular conduct. Yeah, I, I wrote this testimony before the Justice Department wrote their memo, but uh, I didn't need to see it to know what it said. Uh, as the committee well knows, this has been a contentious issue since the enactment of the 74 amendments uh, to the Freedom of Information Act, and it, it was again raised in the Justice Department letter. Uh, our view is that the cases establish that uh, the executive privilege is a narrow doctrine, uh, that it goes uh, to solely the President's ability to obtain advice from his subordinates and even then applies only to specific documents that the President personally designates as requiring protection and continues to do so at the time when a quest for disclosure is made. It simply can't, the privilege simply cannot be construed to swallow up all the information in the executive branch and certainly it is not uh, the privilege was never intended to say that anything that is classified is per se subject to executive privilege. Uh, in any event, whatever the scope of the privilege, uh, we do not believe that it interferes with the right of Congress to set a general standard and procedure for the classification and declassification of national security information. Um, we would hope that a resolution can be found for the limited amount of material here without provoking a constitutional crisis. The standard that you have set is the right one. Uh, if there's something that simply cannot be compromised in this legislation, uh, it is the standard that you set forth in, in Section 6. Uh, the Justice Department seems to be taking the position that this ought to proceed under the current executive order for classification, which is the strictest one that has existed since the Truman Order, and which contains a presumption against disclosure and in favor of classification. Uh, the new standard in the bill, which is one that has a presumption in favor of release, uh, a balancing test uh, that balances the public interest, uh, particularly here as applied to documents that are 30 years old, is entirely appropriate and without it this entire effort will fail. Uh, I am pleased to see the bipartisan support for this because I think it will take that to persuade the administration of the folly of, of this view. Um, let me turn 
quickly to a couple of other uh, provisions that we believe are in need of amendment. Um, the appointment of the review board. We understand the reason that the board has been construed as it is, and we share completely the view that the public must have absolute confidence in this board. And indeed, we take no position uh, on whether or not uh, using a panel of the uh, judiciary to appoint may or may not raise separation of powers concerns. But we are concerned uh, that will invoke an unnecessary amount of controversy into this legislation and that there are ways to get that necessary independence without going that uh, route. Uh, we suggest that you take a look at the model in the, advi the Advisory Committee on Historical Diplomatic Documentation that was created in the State Department reauthorization last year. As you'll recall, a piece of legislation uh, was included that required the State Department to undertake a uh, declassification process uh, of its historical documents. It, it did set a standard different than the executive order, uh, and it set a, a method for um, appointing members to that commission that we think does preserve the integrity, and we would hate to see this, uh, you know, a fight for 10 years going to the Supreme Court on, on those grounds. This needs to proceed expeditiously. Um, another important point is the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, we strongly oppose and see absolutely no basis for exempting this review board from the provisions of the FOIA, the Privacy Act, and more generally from the Administrative Procedure Act. Whenever a body is set up to perform what people view as a uh, important, urgent, and temporary mission, there is a temptation to disclose it from sunshine and disclosure laws. And we, of course, have always opposed that efforts, and we urge that you resist that. Uh, subjecting such entities to disclosure and sunshine will not impede the effectiveness. And moreover, whereas here you have a situation where the public does not trust what the government is doing on a particular matter, to, to take these, this entity out of those laws uh, we think would be a tragic mistake. Moreover, you can be sure that the next time we need to set up a board for this or any other sort of exigent circumstance, that the government will be in here, the executive branch, urging that, uh, that we be disclosed from this laws. Now, we're not suggesting that this board suddenly process routine FOIA requests on the information. We believe the agencies that have been doing that ought to continue. And I think an important point is we do not think that, that the routine FOIA processing ought to stop while this is going on. Indeed, those FOIA requests, I think, are a good indication of what they ought to take a look at first, because the researchers making those requests are probably uh, more likely than anybody else to sort of point in the direction of the important information. But at least with respect to the to the processes of the board itself, to the extent that that information is releasable under FOIA with all the usual exemptions attached, uh, those laws ought to apply. And we think it would be a very big mistake and somewhat ironic in the context of this particular bill. Uh, we, we're equally concerned that there's no judicial review. I mean, we understand the sticking point, and we certainly understand uh, how judicial review has or has not been effective in the context of the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, but it is clear to us that at least, uh, subject to an arbitrary, capricious standard under the APA, that the board should be held accountable and that even though the judiciary is traditionally reluctant to overrule executive branch determinations about releasing information, uh, our experience under the 74 amendments to FOIA suggests that the agencies themselves, known that they have to justify withholding, simply release all, more information and that every step in that process more information gets released. So we think judicial review uh, is particularly important. I have uh, in my written testimony other comments about improving and tightening the standards. I will not repeat them here and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, very constructive suggestions. Professor Parmet, we welcome you and uh, I suppose you uh, agree with the ACLU and, and, and their general comments? Well, I suppose no one would be surprised, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that as a historian and biographer who's devoted seven books to American history and biography, two of them involving a biography of John F. Kennedy, uh, that my bias clearly uh, would be on the side of full disclosure. This is something that has uh, involved me in, in many, many different ways, and I'd like to offer somewhat of a different perspective on this, uh, both as a researcher and as a teacher. Um, 
uh, arguments about national security and personal embarrassment all too often simply serve uh, to mystify the mundane. In the matter of Joint Resolution 454, uh, no such considerations really can be involved. Because in all the years of teaching and writing that I've done, I, in common with my fellow historians, have called the sources to achieve the most valid interpretations. And we can also only gather those interpretations with the cooperation of an open society. The most dramatic opening, and it was only a wedge, came in 1966 with the Freedom of Information Act. Those less secure about access to the record, both in and out of government, have since created some obstacles. But considering that the original act improved upon what we had had to live for before that, I like to think that even at this point, we are far removed from the dark ages of government secrecy. This is something professional historians have always fought for. To do otherwise would be irresponsible. It is, in fact, the objective of all scholars. More to the point, it is a battle for all who believe in open government. The Kennedy case is a prime example. The prominence of Oliver Stone's film has, according to some people, stirred the public out of its complacency and undoubtedly has brought us to where we are today. Almost single-handedly, according to what we sometimes read in the press, disenchantment has set in over official explanations of President Kennedy's assassination. Almost single-handedly, Stone's technical and artistic achievement is believed to have created cynicism about the legitimacy of official explanations. The reality is quite different. As early as the first week of December, 1963, right after the assassination, a published Gallup poll showed that only 29% of Americans thought that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. Nevertheless, as hard as the members of the Warren Commission tried to accomplish what was at least implicitly a political purpose, and I think that has not been stressed sufficiently at these hearings today, a majority of Americans remained skeptical. Kennedy was to them a martyr demigod. His demise had to be at the hand of forces more chilling than the work of an obscure malcontent. For long, several criticisms appeared that faulted the very efforts of the Warren Commission. The honorable appointees found themselves virtual handmaidens to this cover-up, or what was called the cover-up of the crime of the century. And anyone who accepted their values, their, their findings, including myself, uh, were considered naive. At the time I completed the second volume uh, of my Kennedy biography, I noted the magnitude of what had grown from a cottage industry. I think of a lonely chicken farmer waging a solitary battle, Harold Weisberg uh, of Maryland, for example, to a highly professional preoccupation. A published bibliography of works dealing with the assassination, one produced by the Spoke Stokes Committee in 1979, listed about 1,000 titles. One commercially published directory that came out the following year took up 442 pages. And all that was a dozen years ago. Since then, several additional works have made bestseller lists and filled up television screens. The obsession clearly exceeded even the one that followed the Lincoln assassination. The magnitude of all this must be appreciated. Long before Oliver Stone, we already had access to the 1979 report, the published report in many volumes, of the Select House Committee on Assassinations that came out of the 95th Congress. The Stokes Committee, as it was widely called, confirmed the doubts about the Warren Commission and came up as you've heard, with a high probability finding uh, that indeed uh, there was more than one gunman. Now with the release of Mr. Stone's highly controversial film, all this and just about everything else has been synthesized into one mega conspiracy. 
just about every agency in government, from the role of Vice President Lyndon Baines Johnson on down, has been suspected of having some reason for wanting to do away with John F. Kennedy. Or as The Economist really put it, recently put it, everyone was suspected except the janitor and the cats. Neither I nor my colleagues in either class lectures or in our writings compete with what has become the conventional wisdom of the society. That especially in the Kennedy murder, one of the most terrible moments of my own life, all of the institutions of their society have somehow conspired to hide the truth. Invariably, imaginations have focused on the material not seen. The statement of Congressman Stokes that he had been among those who had inspected the evidence and found nothing remarkable failed to still demands for full disclosure. In 1983, the Committee for the Promotion of History, a consortium of 29 historical organizations, petitioned for support of what was then H.R. 160 to release the Stokes Committee documents. I have attached a letter in my record of 1983 from Paige Putnam Miller. Historians are not necessarily of a single mind about the conspiracy thesis, but they are almost instinctively insistent upon the right to know. Absence of full disclosure has long since promoted fantasy and mythology. The Stokes report, in fact, rightly noted that no funding would receive public acceptance if supporting facts were not presented. In fact, the Stokes report went on, it would most likely increase suspicion of government involvement in the assassinations if the finding was simply that agencies and departments were not involved. Full disclosure is not only overdue, it cannot, for obvious reasons, be delayed until well into the next century. And that urgently transcends Oliver Stone's achievement. No technologically superb film postulating, for example, the flat earth theory could find so receptive an audience. That alone tells us something about the status of trusted government and most of all in ourselves. A democratic society has to be willing to produce all that the public needs to know. Let a mature people then conclude as they will. It was fittingly John F. Kennedy who once said that the first obligation of the poet the writer and the historian is to be true to himself and to let the chips fall where they may. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Perman. Dr. Relier, we would like you to have the last word on this <laughs> subject matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, many of us were recalling where we were on that tragic day uh, almost three decades ago. Um, we can remember the investigations that followed we can remember the explanations that were offered and we remember the controversy that ensued and, and still exists. We experienced all of this. Today, however, another generation of Americans has no personal recall of these affairs. A film drama, Oliver Stone's JFK, has seemingly perplex perplexed them and concerned them about the circumstances of President Kennedy's death. To the extent that the Assassination Materials Disclosure Act facilitates the release of government records relevant to the Kennedy assassination and helps the nation's youth and generations to come to know the truth about that calamity, I support its objectives. There are some aspects of this legislation, however, that might be improved. In my prepared statement, I offer several considerations in this regard. In the interest of time, I'll mention only a couple of them now. Also in my prepared statement, I've provided a brief account of the various official investigating committees and commissions that have had access to federal records pertaining to the assassination of President Kennedy or have produced such material. The legislation defines assassination material broadly to include records relating in any manner or degree to the assassination of President Kennedy that were created or obtained by the House Select Committee on Assassinations, the Church Committee, and the Warren Commission. It also embraces such records of any other entity within the executive branch, whether in the custody of the House, the Senate, the National Archives, or any other executive branch agency.
However, I fear that the definition of assassination material may be so broad that it does not provide the agencies adequate guidance for determining the practical limits to the universe of relevant records. Furthermore, it seemingly fails to recognize the distinction, which may become constitutionally problematical, between the possession of and custody of executive branch records found within the collections of the pertinent House and Senate investigating committees, and this matter has significant bearing upon the authority of the agencies to appeal and the President ultimately to block the release of records. At a minimum, it might be specified that executive branch entities producing assassination materials that came into the possession of the House and Senate investigating committees retain custodial authority over such records. Furthermore, officials responsible for the administration of the Freedom of Information Act in the Central Intelligence Agency, Department of Justice, Department of State, and Department of the Treasury, among other executive branch entities, might be consulted to set guidance for determining practical limits to the universe of relevant records. Also, consideration might be given to explicitly including pertinent records of the Commission on CIA activities within the United States. Established by Executive Order 11828 of January 5, 1975, and chaired by Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, this panel had the mission of determining whether any Central Intelligence Agency domestic activities exceeded the agency's statutory authority. Part of its investigation concerned allegations that convicted Watergate burglars E. Howard Hunt and Frank Sturgis were CIA employees or agents and were, in fact, in Dallas on the day of President Kennedy's assassination. The Rockefeller Commission's June 6, 1975 report stated that, and I quote, Neither the staff nor the Commission undertook a full review of the report of the Warren Commission. The investigation, it said, was limited to determining whether there was any credible evidence pointing to CIA involvement in the assassination of President Kennedy." Unquote. When the Rockefeller Commission disbanded, President Gerald Ford apparently took possession of its records and papers. When he left the White House, President Ford took these materials with him as being presidential papers. Later, under the general deed of gift for the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library, located in Ann Arbor, Michigan, these records were given to the federal government. In a recent telephone conversation with an archivist at the Ford Library, I was advised that all of the Rockefeller Commission records are highly classified and, with the exception of the Kennedy assassination materials, are not archivally processed. There are, I believe, about 4,000 pages of so-called Kennedy assassination materials in this collection. Let me briefly mention one other consideration. To assure their political independence, the five members of the Temporary Independent Review Board established by the legislation are appointed pursuant to 28 U.S.C. 49, providing for the appointment of an independent counsel, properly known as a special prosecutor. Accordingly, the board members would be appointed by a special division of the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia in accordance with criteria specified in Section 5B of the legislation. Apart from being awkward and a bit contrived, the arrangement for appointing the five temporary independent review board members may be subject to constitutional challenge. It might be argued that the independent counsel law is being stretched too far to embrace officials who, unlike a so-called special prosecutor, are not carrying out a judicial function. Were the authority to appoint board members vested in the president, there is little likelihood that the chief executive, as happened in the case of the Watergate special prosecutor some years ago, would attempt to remove a board member or a group of board members because of a disagreement concerning an official decision of the board. Indeed, the president has authority to block any release of executive branch records deemed disclosable by the review board. The objective of securing the impartiality and independence of review board members might be just as readily served by retaining the qualification standards set out in the legislation at Section 5B, but having the president appoint the board members with Senate approval. Summarize. There's a, 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 a member getting very faint for lack of nourishment. I have, on I have one final statement, sir. I was just simply going to say that I would agree with Ms. Harris in the alternative that the board members could also be appointed in the same way that the Foreign Relations Series Advisory Board is appointed. I'm glad to hear Thank you say you. that. What about the uh, appellate process that you mentioned? Do you find that to be constructive? The appellate process of using the Court of Appeals? Yes. No, I... I I think that will tie us up in constitutional knots. My, my reason for mentioning that is I'm trying to clear away underbrush that's going to create a, a, a potential veto here. That right. was my concern. Thank you very much, Dr. Elia. I appreciate your cooperation. Let me just ask Ms. Harris about the ACLU uh, experience in 
declassifying and releasing government records in general, how successful have authors, journalists been in obtaining the release of national security records under uh, Freedom of Information Act? Uh, when they're persistent uh, through a long process, they're able to obtain some material. I mean, the truth is since 74, we've been able to obtain more material, not because the courts themselves have ordered it, but it has, I think, changed the nature of the debate within the agencies about what rationale they have to, uh, to uh, proffer. Uh, but generally that means you get some material and, and then you have to litigate it and before you litigate it you get some material. It's hardly the way uh, to vindicate the, the public's right to know. I mean, uh, moreover, the declassification process, as certainly both of the gentlemen with me on the panel can attest to, is, has been a dismal failure and what little was set in place in the early 70s uh, has, uh, uh, has been all but dismantled in the last, in the last decade. I mean, the last time that we testified you before you, we were discussing the denial of our FOIA request for the uh, CIA openness report, denied in full uh, on national security grounds. Uh, when that was subsequently declassified, I think uh, it, it was interesting to see uh, that there was no national security basis for it. And while the committee received a copy, we never, uh, we Not never, yet. they have never come back to us directly to say that uh, now they've declassified the Would the, the members document. of the committee uh, agree with us forwarding? Uh, we, we do Her, have a co copy. You we have do, oh, we do have a copy now, but oh. not because it, not it, because it was it given to the CIA to uh, FOIA office. Did not. I see. Okay. We, we we have we have read it. Uh, it's an interesting document. But if that is what is classified, then I think it speaks volumes to not allowing that standard and that process to dictate the release of these records. Can I ask Dr. Relier if? Uh, he agrees with the general description of the difficulty of obtaining uh, materials under the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, Classified material, sir? Yes. Yes, sir. yes they are probably the hardest, among the hardest to get. Dr. Permit, have you had any experience I've with that particular I've statute? Pe uh, sir, I've had a peculiar one which I, <laughs> I compare with the problem of facing individual auditors before the IRS. Uh, one, one BBC correspondent and I received at about the same time the precise d document. The difference was rather interesting. His was virtually all black, blanked out. Mine was practically all available. So I sh had to share it with him. So what I found... What was the difference? Well, I mean, why, why did that happen? Uh, it, it didn't seem to be terribly logical. It seemed to be fairly arbitrary. Uh, it seemed to be that the the interpretation was made by the individual who handled the documents. So there was no good rationale. We had a good laugh about it and I shared it with him. And ever since then, I've often wondered what, what it is I'm really receiving. What, Dr. Paramount, is your theory of the assassination of President John Kennedy? I've had to uh, deal with this constantly, of course, and I, I still do hold uh, to the Warren Commission in the absence of any better, better evidence. Uh, I must say that I will always uh, indicate the possibility of something coming out from left field uh, to give us something credible. But with each passing year, I'm more and more skeptical about that. Well, did, did not Oliver Stone's uh, persuasive testimony uh, Reinforced the nagging doubts as no, it did not. The Oliver Stone film. You know, no, it, his testimony. The, well, the testimony, today. the testimony simply reinforced the fact that 454 must be passed. That was quite clear from the testimony. Uh, it, that it would not, it would not change my view. It did not change my view because of certain things that have not been said, certain things that have eliminated both from the testimony and from the <coughs> film, and certain things that were put in the film uh, that were quite Well, under, under uh, a, a different circumstance, would you be able to uh, critique in a separate paper for this committee those uh, areas of difference that you uh, had with yeah. the testimony pre presented by this uh, very persuasive first witness. What's interesting, Congressman Kanye says, yes, I could, although I'm not an assassination expert per se. Even from 
my position, I could do that. Uh, I think that an expert could do that precisely, and I could be very, very specific here, but I know you d we don't have very much time. But there are a number of things. Uh, one very, very quick thing is that the film has Lee Harvey Oswald saying I was a patsy. In no place does, is there any credible evidence of his saying that. What he, we do know is he completely denied having been involved. And stating he was a patsy implicitly means that he was being used, that he was accessory, an accessory to the crime. Uh, that was on film. That was one of the misleading things on film. It was on, it was in, in the, uh, it was only on the stone film. It was not on the footage of what, of Lee Harvey Oswald. Now what about the it was Jim, on, it was, it was what not about on Jim footage. Garrison as he was a, uh, what about Jim Garrison as he was portrayed? Uh, it took on a rather heroic uh, mode. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he was described by Mr. Stone as a great American who was, uh, in effect, vilified for uh, two decades. Well, I can only go back to the fact that the, it, took, it took the jury about 55 minutes to throw out Garrison's case at the time. Well, I, I, I have not gone further into Garrison. Uh, but the, I would need more persuasive evidence. I think, Mr. Chairman, that's the very point. We can argue this forever. And, I, and what is extraordinarily difficult here is for someone like myself to try, trying to teach the past, if history has any kind of relevance, to buck what individuals can contrive and they can continue to contrive that as long as the full information has been withheld. And that is the most essential reason why the time has long been overdue for some passage of something like Joint Resolution 454. Well, I, I appreciate that very much, but if, if you can't, as a, a historian and specialist, in this area help us shed more light on it, then who on earth can? We can't compete with film footage. For example, let's go back to what I just said about the Patsy. How do I make that distinction between, with my classes or with anybody? We have, we have many, many reports with many witnesses who transcribed, who made notes of Lee Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald's statements and nowhere did he acknowledge to that degree his complicity. The only place you'll find Patsy is on a page in Mark Lane's book in which Lane has him stating to some unidentified person, completely unsubstantiated, I'm a Patsy. If you, if you accept that fact, then that is a complete misunderstanding of the position Lee Harvey Oswald took at the time he went to his death at the hands of Jack Ruby. Well, true or false, then uh, you teach a course for uh, 20 weeks and your students go out and see a film for three hours and uh, there goes your course down Precisely. The Precisely. Well, then to what extent uh, is this uh, widely acclaimed artistic venture inaccurate and doing a disservice to the American people? It does a disservice because all of our interpretations are, constitute a dialogue. That dialogue can only continue with additional information. If we have additional information, some other producer, let's say if we do it by the media film, our, our, our prime media in our time, can then, can then produce something that corrects the evidence, that can be a corrective. At this point, we can only rest on hypothesis, fantasy, and some outright deception. Well, let's see, suppose you produced the film and, and after you taught the course for 20 weeks and then uh, it was all, it was literally uh, overtaken by a three-hour film and suppose you did a three-hour film uh, in which you would, you would make a serious distinctions between the uh, role of uh, Jim Garrison mm -hmm. 
of uh, utterances that were supposedly made by Oswald. And uh, what about the, uh, the uh, President Johnson's telephone call to the Dallas police? Uh, do you have any, uh, can, well, you, su can you support that as happened or not happened? Uh, no, I can't support that, and I, I can't support any particular interpretation even if it happened as, as to what President Johnson was trying to accomplish. I can imagine he was trying to accomplish a very simple thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think President Johnson was very eager, and it goes back to the time of the Warren Commission, to try to allay the apprehensions about the American public within the American public that there was a vast conspiracy. And that's what I think President Johnson was attempting to do, which is why he established a Blue Ribbon Commission uh, under Chief Justice Warren. I think it was as simple as that. But to go back to what you just asked about film, there, you, you suggested a dialogue of film here. That's no different from what we've been doing in articles and books through the ages. Only now we have a different media. Right. It really is no different. You know, how, how, how are we going to finally come up with a determination of what is the proper role of Christopher Columbus to take something that is current right now? It is the result of a dialogue, and in order to have that dialogue, we have to have evidence to work with. And if the government is going to withhold that evidence, then it cannot claim to be a free society and cannot claim to really honor education and the truth. Thank you so much, Mr. Horton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the things that bothers me a little bit is that, um, and I guess I probably should have asked this question, I don't think that Mr. Stone was trying to um, present a documentary. He was attempting to um, make a movie. He wanted to make money. And um, certainly uh, he's not going to make any money with a movie that adopts the Warren Commission uh, approach. So he picks um, the subjects that uh, are controversial, and, and a movie's made, and it's well done. It's got a good actor who just won all Academy Awards himself the year before. And so there's a lot of appeal, and a lot of people that saw that movie or, uh, were not alive even when, um, when these events occurred. Uh, so I don't have any problem with that. I, I just don't think we ought to think of it in terms of a documentary. Now, I applaud Mr. Stone for what he did. I, I, think, that, I think his movie is a good movie. I'm, I'm glad it was done. I think it brings to the forefront something that probably would not have been brought to the forefront uh, before. Um, and I'm very much interested in getting this material out. I think the quicker we get it out, the better it's going to be. One of the things I'm concerned about is the, um, and we, we discussed this earlier, and that is the so-called loopholes. You remember um, in, in talking with um, Lee Hamilton and uh, Lou Stokes, members of Congress, um, I was concerned about um, what might be so-called uh, private um, under, the, um, under, the, uh, under the guise of privacy or under the guise of national security. And I think generally we feel on this panel, and certainly I feel, that uh, it ought to be at, at a very minimum. But there, um, um, you missed um, uh, Dr. Um, Rallier. You brought out something that, that does bother me a little bit, and that is that um, the Rockefeller Commission that was appointed by President Ford, all those records are apparently beyond our jurisdiction. Possession of the National Archives, which, ha which operates well, the Well, you uh, said Ford in your Library. statement, you said in your statement that records and papers retained by the Commission are now located at the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan. In a recent telephone conversation with an archivist at the Ford Library, I was advised that all of the Rockefeller Commission records are highly classified and with the exception of the Kennedy assassination materials are not uh, processed archivally. Uh, curiously, I was also told that they are not considered to be federal records. The point, I, the point on that was, Mr. Horton, that they, they were considered to be presidential records when President Ford took them away at the end of his administration. He then deeded them back to the government. So they're back in? They're back in that facility, the Ford Library, which is operated by the National Archives, and so they are in, they're in federal So they are, they are then subject to this? Right. 
Well, the other one that I was a little bit worried about, and I'm glad to hear that uh, and have that cleared up. The other one I was a little bit worried about is I'm, I'm informed that um, uh, the uh, autopsy records are in the custody of the Kennedy family. Do you have any knowledge of that? My understanding is uh, that they were given to the archives, but under certain restrictions as to their availability. I think uh, that was alluded to uh, earlier uh, by Mr. Wellens. Um, they are deeded over to be sort of government property in the, to the extent that they are preserved at the archives and the, the who can see them is spelled out in the deed of gift. It's people who have a, a medical or some other type of very serious need to see them. So they're not generally available to the public. A uh, public citizen litigation group has just filed a lawsuit pertaining to those documents uh, on the question about if the documents originally were government documents and then came into the possession of the Kennedy family, can a deed of giving back to the government documents that belong to them essentially uh, no, well, supersede the FOIA? You're asking a legal question as to whether or not that can be... be public, public Citizen, has I think, is either filing that lawsuit tomorrow or has filled it uh -huh. today. So there uh -huh. continues to be FOIA litigation well, around these um, matters. Well, I guess what I'm asking you, Dr. Rallier, is... Um, um, based on that deed, right, uh, without uh, determination by the court, based on that deed, then um, apparently those um, those autopsy records would be um, uh, not subject to our um, our uh, control. Well, first they've been carved out of in the legislation. They're not part of the definition of assassination materials, and secondly, they are otherwise selectively available for public inspection. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Horton. That was an important uh, line of questioning. Mr. Shays. Thank you. I have no um, uh, questions, but I do thank the witnesses for, for coming. I would just like to reiterate my basic feeling, and I feel more strongly as I listen to this hearing, that there are just so many different uh, ways that government tries to keep information uh, from the public, and yet it, we are the we serve the public, and the public, it seems to me, has a right to know. So I applaud the efforts of groups that uh, try to get disclosure on a wide variety of issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mr. Schiff. I also have no questions, but want to thank you for holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman, and reiterate that I think especially since it suggested the government's part of the conspiracy, the government has every obligation, in my opinion, to release everything at its, at its disposal it can possibly release uh, to allay that uh, suspicion. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We, you know we ha have a high regard for all of your work and the continued uh, cooperation you'll have with this committee. This subcommittee stands adjourned. Yeah, well, thank you very much. We have this program reminder for you to join us later this morning as we review events surrounding the Rodney King police brutality case in California. We will speak with U.S. lawmakers and we will hear from President Bush as well as Rodney King himself. Our coverage begins Sunday morning around 6.20 Eastern Time here on C-SPAN. Just ahead on C-SPAN, Vice President Dan Quayle addresses...